I have a uh-huh. half bottle of wine. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I just ashed into my own beer, dude. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again, episode 115. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Trapani, and I am joined by my esteemed resident homies, as always, Joseph, Joel, and Casey. What up, y'all? Yo. Hi. And uh, tonight we're joined by the great John Longstreth. What's up, John? Hey, everybody. What's up? What up? That intro song went through like every time signature in about 30 seconds, didn't it? <laughs> we got to thank uh, Joseph and Christif- Christopher. Uh, wait, Beatty. Always Beatty. I, Beatty. Beatty. Always be Beatty. No. That was badass. I was no, just how do we, how are we, we're supposed to say Beatty? No, I'm supposed to say Beatty. We, we've renamed <laughs> his last name. Beatty. And Christopher Beatty. Check him out from the band Dreamer, uh, John. We should or say or recent fame of. Uh, yeah. I was just passage. I was just hanging out with him like an hour ago for all Paris, day. Yeah, yeah, I, passage, I, yeah. I, I hung out with him at the uh, Cynic show uh, this last weekend. Um, it was inc- so sick. It was, it was super fun. Dude. Shout out oh, Cynic, yeah. great show. Yes, incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Joseph Tell was me. there too. Tell me about that cynic show because I, I, you know, I'm over here in New York, and all of a sudden there's just like cynic sold out. Yeah, right, what is? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's like is this a time hop thing or something like that from years ago? <laughs> but it was a secret show. It, it, well, it, it was their first show of of like in eight years, and it was like them doing the whole Focus album because mm. this is like the 30 year anniversary thing. Mm. So, so they just did that like on the seven thousand seven hundred whatever the fuck it is seventy thousand tons and uh basically um like all these pictures of them up like you know the, all the fallujah everybody they're like floating in the tropical waters and shit i'm like man that looks cool yeah but, uh, have you ever done that have you ever done the, thir- the seventy thousand yeah, tons show? Have, right twice nice. okay, okay twice man yeah we we actually we ended up becoming the honorary pillow fight band oh um, yeah <laughs> i saw was, that dude. and it was really funny because the first year we did it i am I want to say it was 15, 14 or something like that. And they're like, yeah, you're going to be the pillow fight band. And we're like, okay, I think Jason set it up. And I don't know how, but he, he got that going. And But it was like predicated on the fact that they were going to supply the pillows. And so you, you <laughs> will supply pillows and you do merchandise, maybe do pillowcases. So we did pillowcases <laughs> and they didn't supply pillows. And uh, so we uh, started playing and everybody came to the ice rink stage mm-hmm. with the pillows from their cabins and just this <laughs> all, and the pillow fight went off and all of a sudden somebody approaches the stage they killed the power they brought what? the power back up and says everybody that has brought their pillow from their cabin needs to return it as soon as possible or you will be fined and the band will be fined and everybody will be fined and we'll turn this fucking boat around damn it jesus and so that Over was pillows? that yeah, for pillows. And then a couple of years in, in 2018, 19, right before the pandemic, I think, we went out and did it. And this time they supplied pillows. And yeah. that, and you look at the footage, it's pretty damn fascinating. I, it's, <laughs> we're getting up on stage. We're like, oh, great. We're the pillow fight band on the 70,000 tons. Is way Was to it get the honorary <laughs> pillow fight band? I think so. I don't know if anybody else is doing it. No one said anything. Like, no one has told me that, hey, um, I don't know. I can man of war is the pillow fight. Like man of war would never be on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so funny. Well, that, I mean, so that's not, that, would, that brings excitement to the show, though. It's like, dude, you going? Yeah, like we're going would, to the pillow fight, fucking sh- like you know, I like it's totally like... pillow fight to origin, dude. <laughs> yeah, Anthony, I feel like that kind of cruise is just right up your alley, dude. Just sandals. Oh, dude. Like, I, like, no, what this last time when knowing that cynic was going on and seeing all the pictures already from people mm-hmm. that are on there. It's totally me, dude. Just like the Psycho Fest where you're watching a band at the pool. That's me, dude. Mm-hmm. It's totally me. Dude, Cynic is just one of those bands. I had actually never seen him live. 
like before, which is crazy. I saw Sean and, and Paul play with Death to All, like that the human stuff years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like <clears throat> I've never seen Cynic for some reason. Just I just never saw him. And like, dude, it was like one of those bands where it was like, oh fuck, dude. Like yeah. Jesus, like you're not list. watching a metal band you're watching yeah. a, you're watching a progressive fusion band play and yeah they, totally. it's, it's a whole experience dude yeah. it really is we this, um yeah Go ahead, we were dude. just on tour and mark van erp was playing bass for monstrosity oh shit so, oh, if you're familiar mark van erp yeah, yeah. was the original bassist and cynic that was mind-blowing i asked him a couple of questions yeah. i don't think he remembered a lot of it but yeah it was really fucking cool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's rad that's rad that yeah dudes like that like are still working at their instrument working in bands and shit even it's like it 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 sucks to be the dude that's like oh yeah i was on i was the first guy you know before it blew up or whatever but those guys can just hang up their hats and never do it again it's like the first singer of pantera or something it's like i don't even know that guy is but he was the first singer (laughs) mark was killer man he's 56 or something he's the oldest guy on tour um barely drank anything i think he one night he drank something didn't do any drugs uh and just was just happy to be alive and be in shape and just ripping a four string you know, just... mm-hmm. oh, <laughs> and yeah. he was a killer player man him and my bassist mike got on like a house on fire it was great you know? nice so that's it's nice to see that man it's 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 nice to see the old guys that are still out there and not out there being like oh let me tell you, yeah, like, oh, yeah. you, you don't out. understand what it was like. You and your, right. you and your yeah, fucking yeah. tracks and your Pro Tools. I had to count, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's annoying, too, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I will say about the Cynic show, uh, the coolest thing for me that I didn't expect was that they had a keyboardist slash vocalist who's in the oh, band. He's cool. really good, really good, yeah. Um, also doing seems to be old... doing the karaoke on this guy's got some style dude his shoes like like these pointy <laughs> shoes and like this whole like like suit he was wearing that guy is cool man nice i was like damn dude i don't know where he's from like or maybe if he's, he's from la somewhere yeah. i guess he yeah. works at a venue up here i learned um nice. joel and i are super and john we're all super jealous that we weren't there with you guys because you should be, dude. That was a show that I should have been at, dude. For I probably sure. could have made it too. I thought my mom was coming into town, so I was chilling out. Well, she was flying in. She everyone else is there, man. Trevor, well, <laughs> everyone else is there. there, dude. Thanks for <laughs> adding on to it, dude. Full yeah, US Trevor, or I told you about it. Man. I know. Well, they're gonna come, so it's the, okay, they're, they're touring all year long, basically. Yeah, they're gonna tour. That's what sure. Paul said. So, uh, it was so much fun, dude. Be yeah. looking out for that. But well, anyways, we need, to, we, need yeah. to, we need to bug Max Phelps about yeah. it. Hey, Max. Max but, is cool. Yeah, right. He's cool, dude. All right. So uh, well, well, we thought of a name for I... Paul at the show. We were calling him Metal Gandhi. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> it works. works. It, it does work. It's good. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah. No, we haven't done any plugs yet, dude. Let's do the plugs real quick. Um, Magic Spoon. <laughs> 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 what was that? Battle Forge <laughs> Coffee, dude. Oh, hey. Yeah, dude. Mike Hamilton. Yeah. Sh- sh- I need to get to, some coffee, actually. Shout out to our up. death metal dad, Michael ha- Michael Hamilton. Michael Bash. Giving him his full Michael name. Jared <laughs> Hamilton. <I don't> Michael. <laughs> are Michael, you sponsoring you got coffee everywhere? John, are you sponsoring <laughs> coffee these days? I have been kind of a grandfathered in influencer for death wish since they started oh yeah i, I've been all I about know death wish. i know those guys it's funny because i used to work at a coffee shop in saratoga springs new york and anybody that's in the chat knows the place um it's right in the center of town it's bagels and coffee and it's been there since the 90s and it's the only business that is constantly slammed all year long and a couple of the guys that were working there started working at a coffee shop across the street and this guy, Eric, I just ran into him one time. He goes, yeah, I'm bagging up coffee for Death Wish in the basement of this place. over." Here. I was like, what? And so like like handful of little of, of music dudes from Saratoga Springs ended up like getting in with that company before they were a big company. And now they're all that place is I don't it's I've never seen a, a marketing campaign for coffee like that. There you mm-hmm. go. They're good dudes. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I basically searched for, I remember when it came out, I had searched for like most caffeinated coffee brand, you know, I was like, 
what's got the most caffeine you know like and death wish came up right away like about 2018 17 and i just bought fucking so much of it and it fucking made my heart freak out a little bit it was good. yeah right <laughs> you can we um uh, we, we were putting like the restaurant job we were putting in the order for something we we're putting in like the week week long every week do the order and my boss greg he's just like you wanted me to get a drum of powdered caffeine and he's like, <laughs> just this drum Whoa. of powdered caffeine it's just from columbia or something i don't know where it's from and what are you gonna <laughs> do with powdered caffeine Other i was than already thinking about snow kill yet, people <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how next door to cocaine or methamphetamine that is. Ah, but... dude, I, I don't understand. I, I don't even want to begin to understand what a caffeine overdose feels like, dude. Sounds yeah. too much. Because we've already, we've all felt the too much caffeine feeling, and that's not fun at all. Yeah. You know? Do you My, be terrified? It'd be terrifying if you had like t- way too much caffeine and way too many edibles at the same time. No, uh, you probably, probably go to the hospital. You probably yeah. probably go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Concentrated your... hippie, Randomly. hippie speedball, dude. It's like with the caffeine, your heart, your heart's doing like like doubles with the feet. You know, it's, it's doubling <laughs> with the with the with the pot. Then it starts popcorning a little bit, and you're like, oh shit, I need to go fucking. <laughs> 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 That's funny. Oh man. So ben here's Hostel. a fun here's a wait fun real quick. Wait, yeah. Before we do, let's finish the, the plug, dude. <laughs> oh Manscaped Battleforge guy. <laughs> Manscaped. Up. Yeah. I mean we spent the next last dot four org. minutes about Death Wish and other things. Yeah, let's uh, let's pump our merch a little bit. <laughs> let's pump. do it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, dude. Battleforge coffee. No, let's finish. Let's give respect to the homies. Battleforge coffee. <laughs> Get over there. Mike Hamilton coffee dot coffee. Come on, support the homies for sure. Uh, All right, absolutely. All right, now Joseph, you can be our ma- model. Well, this is actually the. Why does that keep happening? <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, one of a kind long sleeve Cali Death podcast uh, uh, zombie design. Oh, long sleeve. Mm. There was one. It's one of those like homie moves. Ben threw a long sleeve in the order, which oh, is nice, in XL. Dude. But uh, it, it's the design is available on all the. Short sleeves, uh, small through double XL, uh, and uh, twenty five bucks. Uh, and then we've got the OG design as well. Which wait, I... stand up one more time. Let me see the. Let me see your front one more time. That's a dope, OG. fucking design, dude. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Mm-hmm. I gotta get one of those. Cool, Shout out triple oh, yeah. space, Mark and uh, mm-hmm. Santiago out there. Shout out. For us. Very cool. Triple says. Yeah, actually, so we have a week before I will be gone for two weeks. So if you want to get a t-shirt from us, order it this week and I'll get it out to you before I go. And then of course And if you order while he's out, we'll still get it to you. It just might take a little bit longer. It'll just take a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Be patient. It'll get to you though. Mm -hmm. And then uh shout out Curtis who's on the screen. He bought the first american order of this design so shout out curtis dude that's what's up dude and uh last but not least uh subscribe and like and do all the good things that people do for channels and uh, our channels are (laughs) twitch.tv slash kelly the fuck and i don't i never know how to say that right just oh i used to say push all the buttons dude just Casey's like, I guess, you're, I guess you're here already. I don't know if you need the fucking website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the people that are listening afterwards on YouTube, if they didn't, if they want to see it live, come over to twitch.tv slash Cali Death Podcast. And uh, if you're not, if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't subscribed, dude, subscribe. It's free. Come on, help us out. And then uh, smash that yeah, subscription button. Exactly. <laughs> And we love you guys and hit the social medias to find out who's going to be on before the episode as well. And John, no. where do you want people to, <laughs> where do you want people to go? <laughs> Any places? Um, Go to Spain and visit the La Sagrada. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to go to Spain. Dude. It's very, very pretty. Oh, best I've never been there. there. I like to do. Oh, I don't know, man. I mean, every anybody that knows who I am knows what I do. Originband.com. You know, I, I spend I spend more time off tour on Facebook on my personal page. And on tour, I do more Instagram. So. Okay. But, uh. Is do you any lessons method? or anything? Is there is there a method? Any... Oh, I so. do. I do give lessons. I'm just. I'm a little jammed up until March. Okay. 
you know, but you just yeah. contact your social medias to get the, uh, yeah, definitely the old... hit me up yeah, there. Cool. Um, I want to know your, your method real quick. Why is it Instagram only on tour? I don't know. It's not a method. It's just what happens. Okay. Um, and I think I'm yeah. just also leaning a little bit towards Instagram yeah. a little bit, a little bit more because you know, Facebook, it's, uh, yeah, Facebook is starting to look like MySpace at the end of MySpace. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's Facebook, kinda... I have more followers because I don't push my Instagram at all. But Facebook, I'll always have for my older generation family and friends that still cling to Facebook. You know, all the boomers hang out. On exactly. Dude. Yeah. I'm all about and the I... like Instagram posts to Facebook, and it's just like. Uh-huh. just easy but it all comes from instagram so you don't even have to go there just post there see yeah, that's, that's just a boomer that. thing for me for me to say that like oh you can just post on instagram and you can post links on over. facebook though. do i yeah. have to open a pdf it's the same yeah. <laughs> they they still has to send yeah, yeah. Oh, me sure it is. we know that i know Casey, <laughs> Casey has yeah. to send me a special email with the link for each episode because i still don't know how to sign on to my social media on the computer <laughs> <laughs> The password issue. It doesn't have any tires on it, so you can't sign up. Maybe I'm just I'm maybe, to be on Facebook, pack, 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 maybe pack, the reason why I'm on Facebook lovely. I'm staying on Facebook is because that's that's where I should be. I'm just with the boomers, dude. It's also a habit, dude. It's just it, it is, is it's such a, a habit. habit. It's like a, it's a an addiction thing. Oh, totally. No. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah. All right. I, well, yeah, it's designed that way, right? With the likes and the message interactions in general is all this this uh, 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 it's fake creepy, currency the of reels, sorts. The, the reels on Instagram are way better, though, than Facebook. And it's, well, Instagram's you know, more like instant gratification. Yeah. You just like see the pictures. Is that what I if, you want to read, if you want to read what they want to say, then you can click, okay, I'll read it. But if you don't, you just fucking keep going. My my yeah, big my my big college stuff. try my big college try for the show every week is doing uh, stories. Should I not be doing stories? Should I be doing college. reels? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. Don't worry about that. <laughs> just Anyways, diesel so, diesel. I don't know. Yeah, so, so John. Yeah, so it's, uh, John, you have an incredibly uh, aesthetic uh, background. It's it's every time. It's very and, reedy. And, and when you zoom in. Uh, you can see the outside. That's the actually New York City. Oh, oh damn, that's nice, cool, dude. That's, mm. <laughs> yeah, that's, I just wanted to compliment your, uh, right your. It's like a cozy New York apartment. It is, and I did not write any of these books, <laughs> and I haven't read any of them either. How, I was going to say, <laughs> what? How many of you actually read? None of them. <laughs> is it like Jeez. where you, they're already there when you move in, and it's like part of the apartment? Um, yeah, they're just. A, it's just a picture. It's not. Yeah. They're not even real books. It's just, <laughs> yeah. just covers. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm in a model You're apartment a right now. Mm, it's like no. fake amps on the stage. You know, there's no speakers in them. Yeah. 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 How many? How many? Uh, how many cabs are they actually using? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. keep it up. Yeah. What was that Tama uh, equipment, by the way? Is that That's a, a Tama model? rhythm watch, man. That is an old school piece of equipment. You know, What's that yeah, for? That's, yeah. That's all that metro- I'm like. sorry. It's a click. It's a metronome. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Roll back for sure. Yeah. Throw Thought it was a label maker. Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you use that currently in your in your setup, John? Oh, nice. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I was like, "Cheers, dude." <laughs> it's just I don't. I have it. I don't know why. I I pulled it out of. I I got into a box of stuff, and I'm like, "Oh, damn!" There's my rhythm watch. Um, nice rhythm. You know, every now and then, you just go okay. through a rent. You go. You, you, you take an errant turn in your house, and you run into a box, and you open it, and it's full of all what? What's it? I don't. Know. Tamarin are those, watch. Are those sticks next to you as well? Those are sticks. What size sticks are those? That is that is standard 5B long by Minel Stick and Brush Company. Man, you want to go somewhere, go to that. Yeah. Those are amazing. Because nice. I was using like this crazy custom sized scorpion drumstick mm-hmm. for a while. And it was really cool. It was a 17 inch, it was a 17 inch uh 5b with a mm-hmm. that was cut from a 2b so it was a 17 inch 5b with like a 2b fucking front so the whole thing was just mm. and yeah. you know my main man over there at scorpion is no longer there so i was like hmm so i got got out of there and went over to minel because minel's a fucking wonderful company mm-hmm. you know Sick. oh yeah that's cool so all right 
let's let's dig into you a little bit dude i mean you've obviously from the beginning of hearing you play it was it it grabbed me it's not real (laughs) (laughs) and it was uh it was on a relapse compilation i've mentioned it numerous times on the podcast but um was it contamination is that what they called the yeah i think that contamination contamination was a big relapse thing at that point in time yeah there was multiple versions you know multiple compilations they used the contamination uh moniker and uh it was just a way to dump a bunch of their bands on you in one release you know everybody was doing that you remember the at death's door compilations and oh yeah death is just Mm -hmm. the beginning and all that you know Mm -hmm. no yeah they put us on that and then they put us on the contamination tour in 2000 with exhumed and um nice exhumed and today is the day and deceased and uh da, 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 carnage yeah it oh, was, yeah. A, it was a, yeah. the heyday of relapse like I, I, that era of relapse for me is i cherish it so much even i mean pre that too all that stuff from the inception of relapse up until that point and after i i uh i cling to that a lot during my you know adolescent metal years you know, as a way, as, as a guide, like we always talk about humans that would guide us, but you would also be guided virtually through compilations and, and other things through rec- record labels would actually grab your hand and, and here come through my garden and see all the shit that we're growing over here. You know, I'm on the street team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, so who here is, I don't know if you, relapse message board were you a part of that era yeah the, oh I really yeah a little bit of that For i sure. mean we were more yeah, smn yeah. smn news mm-hmm. and the Derek karate forum of course oh, the yeah. Derek karate forum of course yeah 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 that was yeah, that was yeah. Shit. but yeah no i was on the relapse forums weren't you joel mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah might have been might have just looked at it maybe yeah i think yeah, I was 23 years ago now guys i know it's yeah. crazy uh, yeah. but that that's how i came across your drumming and it was one of these things that i had never heard up until that point you know the gravity blast was foreign to me um uh just a lot of your your style was was something that was i i needed to continuously listen to get you know a, a taste for it not that it was something that I didn't have a taste for when I first heard it, but I'm just saying, you know, it's just one of those things where you, you get this new thing. You gotta, you gotta acquire a taste for it by continuously listening and understanding. So yeah, that's, that's what I was going through with origin and uh, the hyperactivity of the band. And, and now later, you know, having a taste for it and realizing the brutality of origin too. Not a lot. I don't think a lot of people talk about, how brutal origin really is you know it's all no, about they get, the speed, speed thing they get caught with the speed thing they get caught with the speed and the shred and all that but yeah. when you guys settle into the groove that 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 was something that i you know in my cramming for this episode realizing with you know a lot of origin stuff is why don't we talk so much about the heaviness but i am getting ahead with this i'm just basically doing my intro of where i came across to you and and why i love your style and and how how that style got me ready for so many other bands as well and uh so thank you for giving me that upgrade and <laughs> <laughs> upgrade yes dude and and Anthony but 2.0 <laughs> for yeah. sure dude and but really you know if you, you know the show how we like to go we go back way before that dude nope childhood let's let's hear about well, some childhood I'd like, before memories. we get into that like okay. i just want i want to say something really quick so like john dude we played shows together and stuff but i did when i was <laughs> so young and stuff man i had like you were, you were like a huge i mean still to this day like one of my favorite drummers like in Thank metal you, and like and uh I, I i remember when it was just like oh my god origins play like you know when in infinitus or whatever it is like the iii I, I came out like i was just like dude that shit was like the craziest thing we had, like all of us had like ever heard it all like i just was completely blown away this is all before in time begins and all that kind of bullshit you know and all that and like was it was blown just, away again today dude, listening to it dude. yeah and like in the, the gravity i mean everything was just like 
man what the fuck but i mean, I used to go see you back in high school and you played skinless and all that stuff like i've been i mean mm. so many shows back in the day but Jesus. yeah it's i don't know i just uh it, it, it's you're such a huge influence to me like like getting into metal like back like in the late Thank 90s you. you know and early 2000s you know do and, you uh, i yeah. know you played it joel i wasn't sure if you were there or not but i think it was 2000 st louis oh yeah 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 Casey, we were there. You, Anthony was oh there yeah too. That was yeah. everybody played. Yeah. That. Origin, Decrepit Birth, was Odious. Um, 2000, was it? 2000, I think Vile yeah. was yeah. there. Yeah. Vile, Deeds of Flesh. Yep. That, that was the first was time. Bloodletting tour. We met up with yeah. you guys. Right. And yeah. the promoter just sat at the bar and got drunk the entire time. And then, and then didn't disappeared. Pay anyone. <laughs> Well, remember Dude. there was a, there was a, that there was was a whole tornado. Story there was a tornado that ha went yeah, half the city was out of power. And, yeah. And so for some crazy reason that ended with this guy not paying any of the bands i think right i pretty much didn't expect to Probably. get paid when we got I there i was like oh there's two guys here it's All funny right. how <laughs> memories are but i remember we did actually get paid because i i think that we kept harassing him until his mom came and gave us a check or some shit like oh, that shit. yeah you sure check I, yeah i remember it was like this thing oh, we're and it was like two o'clock in the morning we had all just raged and played shows and and or played our sets and and whatever, but then no promoter to be found. Yeah, right. and and that's what I remember phone calls until somebody finally answered, said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna come down yeah. with my mom and <laughs> give you guys a check." Uh, I don't even know if the check fucking cleared or whatever. I actually don't remember that part. Just check for twelve fifty because it came from his grandma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't spend it all in one place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that was what was fighting, what was working against us is there was a fest like an hour and a half or two hours away. That was a pretty big fest, and you guys were on tour, we were on tour, and the the book, you know, the the uh, what do you call it? They just booked the show there probably not really thinking about what would be uh, they probably treated it as, as what you would call a routing show today you yeah it's yeah. like here's a gas money show but but really it's like yeah we're fighting for our gas money right but, there and homeboy left without it but yeah it was, it was, half the city was out of power if you remember yeah, exactly that. yeah, that yeah. Was interesting yeah, was, that was insane i still yeah. remember james james lee like freight train coming up to us after we we're leaving we're packing up he's all all right, guys. So don't go that way. It's gonna route mm -hmm. you that way. Don't go oh. that way. And we're like, we're like, oh, okay. We like kind of took it like half heartedly, yeah. and then we went that way. <laughs> so you guys we like, it? Uh. Yeah, and like I remember we went and there's like people like running up to our fucking like van. Like he's all he's all. If you go that way, don't stop at the stop signs. <laughs> and I was like, holy uh. shit! Like because there's there's no power. Like it's kind of like lawless over there. So. Don't do that. And we we did it, and we just had to run stop signs. <laughs> I rem I think I remember something like that because him and my buddy Chris Wilson came up together. Chris Wilson's mm -hmm. a drummer of Troglodyte, and mm -hmm. they came in and they were telling they were saying something about how they came through the no power district to get to where they are. So uh, that 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 checks out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was definitely sketchy. I, I, mean, I remember that, that night, tracks. John. You had like a. Uh, like a new kit or something that it was like a carbon fiber drum mm -hmm. set or something like mm -hmm. that. And you were showing me and I was just like, what? Like, it was crazy. Yeah. And I remember fanboying out. Cause I'm like, Oh shit. Do we were playing with origin. John's back. In and, the uh, and James and, King uh, was there. He was sitting there like watching on the side going like, right. oh. you guys were like, make, like making eye contact. So much stink. Yeah. Face yeah. We playing echoes. <laughs> no, I was standing next to him. I remember I was standing next to him. I remember you'd be playing a part and you like, maybe nope. like messed up one thing. You'd be like, what, you guys would make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> it's hardcore. And James King calling out, uh, odious, uh, 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 like random requests. songs that we had to do. Yeah, no, we had to do. Like, oh, really? Like we didn't yeah. practice them. He's all there's like fucking ten people there, so he's like, we'll play this song. We're like, well, we know how to play it. Let's just try it. I guess yeah. <laughs> for James. Yeah, sounds really fun. Yeah, 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 actually, yeah. Was I really also fun. have this random me memory specifically of us playing at Irving Plaza in, in New York with you guys. I think it was I... the same tour. I don't know. Maybe, we did Summer uh, Slaughter together. Maybe that was, this, on... was that Summer. No, that was like a because I thought we did Summer Slaughter with Origin, but. Was that Summer Slaughter at Irving Plaza? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even. Well, I don't even know. The only time I did Summer Slaughter in Irving Plaza must have been 2008 or nine. Eight or nine. It was. That might have been it. It was the. It was the. They they had divvied. They broke the tour up into two nights. They put all the core bands. 
Yep. I remember the, that. They put all the death metal bands on Friday and they put all the core oh, bands on yeah. Saturday. I think that was good. And yeah. that was actually how I ended up getting that was the first time I met Chris from Minel. And it was like the Sick. one of the first times we got a full room origin chant. So it was just like, whoa. Oh yeah. The band was falling apart at that, you know, at, at the end of that. Because that was eight weeks, seven weeks, fifteen bands. You know, and mm. we were all smashed into a, a van when, with no trailer. And yeah, that was actually the the, the last run we did with James Lee. Yep. Know, yep. Unfortunately. Definitely. But, you know, mm -hmm. that might have it might have been that night. Mm -hmm. James but, um, Lee uh, commented on my uh, post about this podcast news all looks familiar. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Sounds like a James thing to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. James, I still remember James, that. Too. that yeah, James I love is James. doing good. I chat with him from time to time. It, I, you know, he seems healthy. Makes yeah, me yeah, happy. definitely. I saw good. him. Uh, I saw him last June or July, and Over I didn't. Minnesota? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know how to handle it. I'm just standing there. I'm like, <sighs> like a mild anxiety attack, not knowing how to talk to James because I hadn't seen him in so long. Right. <laughs> He used right. to be the one initiating all the conversation. He would just come up to your group, hey, what's going on? With, hey, you know, man, like, yeah, he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 He would always come up and talk to you about weather or the highway system. <laughs> yep. No, he, <laughs> he was like, no, he, one thing that impressed me about him is that he was always like, he was like, I know I drive all the, I try to drive every time. And he's all, I don't need a GPS for any, like for the tour. He would just drive <laughs> through the United States and not need a GPS. Like he would, like that, how he prided himself on knowing all, all the systems there. and knowing how to he get. He had it. an atlas. Everywhere. Okay. He had an atlas, Peter. and yeah, I think he just no, he did not need a GPS, and yeah, wow, you know, and that was also the kind of thing that sort of kept him on track for a large chunk of the time I was in the band. But no, he would, uh, you know, he would go. We'd stop at truck stops, and you'd, you'd see him chatting up a trucker or something like that, or, and then he'd just dig into his atlas and, okay, cool, and then you drive us the entire way there. <laughs> it's crazy. You That's know, whether wild, it was, dude. you know, three hours, five hours, nine hours. And, mm. he's, he's and it's funny, world. we complain about, oh, yeah, you guys don't remember uh, MapQuest, but this fool was <laughs> like, no, dude, just an atlas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember printing out an entire tour's worth of map quests. Yeah, oh, dude. Yeah, directions, putting it in yep. a binder. And... Yep, yep, exactly. exactly. The, the whole things tour. we used to do. Or the luxuries right. of You're like having this address a tour to manager. This. You get a, a file folder every night for mm. the next day with map quests <laughs> and everything. <laughs> that was always the worst getting handouts from the tour manager with map quests. That was terrible. It's like, we got our own. It's fine, dude. You know, <laughs> you know, too young for this. Yeah, dude, totally. Shit. You don't know the. I remember Matt. Remember in decrepit the first one we did where he had like oh a Garmin. Uh, yeah, the Garmin. The, he had like this Garmin, but it was like a like a like a like a, like the version of like a tube TV in, in, as a GPS. yeah yeah. It was like yeah. this big. Oh, it looked TV. like a tube TV. That's I cute. mean, it was. It had a, it had a, we said it, it to like Australian too. We're like, oh, it's like they're all like laughing Australia. when it would mispronounce things. We're like, like, oh. Oh. <laughs> I remember I drove like two hours the, the wrong way and it just rerouted and then it was just like what go back well, that thing then, that thing in Houston does not know what to do because of all the stacked yeah. freeways in Houston it would just be like oh you're here you're here you're it's like uh, no go this yeah. way and they're just like yeah. fucking drive us in circles and shit I think Houston and Atlanta have to be most impossible places in the country to drive exactly I, I mean, agree New York of course but I mean and I don't what what's the giant highway in in, in LA the, the 405. 405. Uh, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> um, LA, yeah. But yeah, it's like, um, oh, shit. Did you guys ever use Master Tour? Is that still a thing? Master Tour? No. Master, never Master heard of it. Tour. It was like yeah. a. I, we had a tour manager at one point in time. He goes, It's all on Master Tour. And he waved his cell phone at us. And I'm like, well, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but no, Garmin, Jason, my vocalist, has like three of those things. And. I don't. I think we finally got to the point um, on U.S. tours where we all just use our cell phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah nowadays, yeah. I bet you now, yeah. computers now yeah, in your pocket. Back in the days, like trying to log into like, oh, dude, like on this phone, really like here. Facebook, and I'm like, it's all loading forever. And then you're like, oh, I got a message. <laughs> like, you know, you're like trying to like. I got a text message. Google Maps <laughs> or Waze. Google Maps or Waze. That's the only two things people talk about getting places. Right. Mm. Yep. But nowadays, mean, like, I mean, I use Google, GPS. Yeah. 
yeah, Google Maps and Waze, yeah. Waze, Waze is good for weird things like and Waves LA tells you where all Waves, yeah, Waze tells you where all the cops are. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, so that's, that's cool. But it, but Google bought them, so they use them too. So it's, it's all built in there. Blackberry. Google bought Waze, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you guys Google ever have Blackberries? Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Oh, hell I yeah, dude. I like my Blackberry, Blackberry I Messenger. And uh, yeah, Blackberry Messenger was the shit. I had still hasn't Blackberry... been topped. Was it the Pearl or something? I, I still have one that had a full QWERTY keyboard. You didn't have to do the sick internet connection. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> now he's frozen. Oh, I was doing that too. We both zoomed at the same time. Uh, is, it, is it good now or no? Yeah, it's great. Dude, it's freaking great. <laughs> looks awesome. All right, proceed, dude. Look at the You guys <laughs> take it from here then. <laughs> if I'm looking like a, if I'm frozen, why am I taking it? Yeah, you're you frozen look and you're you look you, good, dude. You that's nice all I switch. have. <laughs> okay, now, now it went back to all five. I'll just leave it on that for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> it's, it's, an epic, it's an epic. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, do it again. He's just dude. that high. <laughs> yeah. So I, I gotta ask my yeah. my drum question before this derails completely. Um, <laughs> which it won't. It's fine. Pull us, pull us back on track, man. Yeah. Um the Joseph's here for you. Uh, so I was setting up, I, I was tuning, uh, I put new heads on my drums. Um, I play, uh, extreme metal. Some of it's pretty technical. None of it is like complete. Actually, that's not true. Some of it is complete fast origin worship. How do you tune your toms for the tech death style? Ooh. So you get that really fast attack. Yeah, do you do really higher like... tension on the beater versus. Oh, wait okay. a minute. Wait, are you talking about toms or are you talking about kick drum? Uh, both are. I'm not. I'm not worried about kick personally right now, but that is something. Oh, no, we sure should. We should address all in. these. I'm curious. This, this oh, is each, I want to know kicks, toms, and snare. I'm, I'm now. You got me all interested. So well, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, like, I picked up the entire eight, ten, twelve thing from Derek Roddy. Wait, oh, mm -hmm. no, I picked I up the twenty-inch kick drums from Derek Roddy. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, eight, ten, twelve. Just yeah, I think I saw him do that. And I love that toms, song. I you know eight, ten, twelve. They're smaller, perfect. So yeah. whoop, and I like to tune those mm -hmm. as low as I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, so they basically go. Yeah. yeah. You know, and what I'll do is I'll usually start with my sixteen, and I'll tune. I'll put the heads on. Put new heads on that. Do the finger in the center. Work out the wrinkles. Mm -hmm. Make sure that it's all the Let's tones are the same on everyone, yeah. and then crank it way up. Mm -hmm. And I'll do that with all the drums. This is if, if if I have all the time, crank them all the way up, throw them in the corner, go get mm -hmm. lunch, or go mm -hmm. do something else. Um, mm -hmm. Come back and then detune everything down into place. And I'll usually start with the 16-inch floor tom, which I have mm -hmm. on my left. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and tune that down as low as I possibly can. How low can I get the 16? Mm -hmm. And then the 14 to step up, and then I kind of go up that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I try and get Eight and 12, 10 and 14, mm. 12 and 16 to make intervals or chords rather. Mm -hmm. But nice. low tuning with two ply heads is my personal favorite. Um, mm -hmm. There's been other schools of thought, you know, when I came home from the summertime tour and I swapped out my drum kit. So now my reference kit is in my studio. I'm here in Brooklyn and um the chrome kit betty is in kansas this new new origin kit but i mm -hmm. kind of i came home and for some crazy reason i just i tuned them up higher so they they sounded a lot more like um like the toms on Dahmer by macabre which mm -hmm. oh man i got a fuzzy camera now but um you're good this is on the re on the reference the pearl oh, reference okay. yeah mm -hmm. and so those sounded really good tuned up a bit higher because they're the reference tom so like mm -hmm. i think the eight like eight ten and twelve they all got different shell compounds to you know to for the frequencies that they're supposed to do mm -hmm. you get to a 14 and they start putting african mahogany inside to warm it up and then you get to the 16 you got african mahogany and you got a completely round over bearing edge so it just goes bip. Mm -hmm. um yeah kick drum is uh medium medium high i guess i don't know 
naturally my kick drum kind of sounds like the kick drum on failures for gods by immolation mm -hmm. kind of could bip 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 and i just try and make that thing as dead as possible because i like the you know i like the sensor triggers the most i like the rtk 30 the most yeah that's what i got too and I, I mean i have the uh foot blasters but um i went back to the on uh, the 30k i have the on triggers and they're great but mm -hmm. you know what's it like touring uh, it's like every atmosphere is different mm -hmm. most importantly whether or not you're going to have uh, like a flat wooden surface to set your drums up on you're gonna have a right. flat concrete surface or you're gonna have one of those terrible bouncy risers you know yeah Exactly, which makes yeah. which makes your bass drum pedal and uh, yep yep you get floppy on those weird stages i know yeah floppy mm -hmm. yeah this was uh this was covered extensively in the very enjoyable episode you did on the copper crab podcast and i got a lot out of listening to that one too yep. um, yeah dude. which nice. i would uh i would refer our listeners to as well if you want i even... didn't know he was on that honestly oh, yeah. yeah that was, that was not that long ago yeah oh sick fuck yeah but you've you've done I'm a whole working. europe tour since then so i'm sure we can talk about yeah, new man. stuff too. that but, was a uh, lot of fun just quickly on the drums uh the tuning so um do you do you consider the resonant head and how to tune i forget the name of it but the, there's some sort of uh technical term for how tight it is compared to the batter head do you take that stuff into consideration i try and get them at the same the same pitch okay so you just aim and for uh, ex yeah aim well tuning. i i typically do the bottom head first maximum resonance why. between the two that way right i don't know why i do the bottom head first but i try and get everything the same i try and get the top head and the bottom head to be the same pitch same pitch around the you know things boom get that going mm -hmm. and depending on how it wants to react then i'll you know adjust either the bottom head or the top head a lot of guys like to you know as you're to get really dorky I don't know how true this is. This is old knowledge, and this is before um, Evans released the 360 stuff. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. drum head technology has moved since. But a lot of people, when their bottom heads, because who changes their bottom heads? Right. Yeah. You know, but those things dry out, I guess. So as your bottom heads would dry out, people would start bringing them up, mm. you know, and... Yeah, so you it's like as your bottom head became less and less um, resonant, you could just bring it up a little bit, and you'd have a different sound, but you would have a serviceable sound by bringing your bottom head up higher than your top head. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably where that comes from. But hmm, as far as I go, I tune by ear. I put my thumb in the center, and I get the wrinkles out. And same thing on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll bring it up way high for a bit and then I'll bring it down. So it's, you know, so it seats. Mm -hmm. I don't know how important the seating is these days. Cause remember when you'd use the, uh, Remo heads and they would make that cracking sound. You guys ever deal with that? Oh yeah. I know. Evan's yeah. heads don't do that. So I don't know how important yeah, it is, but I like the hoop is so different. It's look at the... it and just make sure it's got the same gap around. Is the the yeah. I, I'm sure that you're gonna answer this the way that I think you are, which is the order that you do it in. Is it like a star pattern? You always gotta go across yeah, one and around. You, just, you do. You can do multiple. Yeah. Right? yeah. You want to do star pattern when the heads are brand new. Exactly. At least. Yeah. You want to do sure. star pattern to make sure you have the same tone happening. Initially. And then from there, you kind of go around and listen to it, and you know. There's drum cool. dials out there. There's tune bots. There's yeah, all kinds of things, and I just kind of learned how to do it by ear. Yeah, you know, I watch I just, drum techs. Watch a drum tech tune drums. Don't watch yeah. a drummer tune drums. Watch a good <laughs> drum tech. Malta, Malta is he's he was the drum tech for Behemoth back in 2003, and I got to watch him tune drums, and that you know. Drum techs know how to tune drums. Drummers don't. <laughs> right. This this, this time He's around, I just I loaded uh, I loaded the Get Good Drums Invasion Kit on my software, and I just tuned to the drum software that I'll probably be sample layering with just for uh, compatible tuning. What and is I thought Get that Good Drums? Good. 
That's the software uh, uh, company uh, done by the periphery guys, and they use their samples that they take. Oh, so it's samples. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's VSTs, so it's it's a full. You can program with it. You can have it play. It, it's you know up up there with Superior Drummer. It's a, basically a Superior Drummer. Um, I have Trigger. So. Yeah, that's sure. Stephen Slate, right? Stephen Slate Audio Center. I got it right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's top of the top of the line stuff. It wasn't that expensive. I mean, yeah. John, have you ever heard of? <laughs> obviously, you've heard of the Evans EC2 and all that kind of stuff. But but have you ever tried just the bot, like the the resonant EC heads with like regular top heads? You ever mess with that? So they have a little bit of. They're crazy. Uh, it's not extra coat, but like extra treatment around the edges. Well, of the, so the so that that like that the Evans EC heads have that like you know like ring around it. It's kind of like pinstripe. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. It's the better the resonant pinstripe. heads that have those. Not that like if so they have these resonant ones that basically have that ring, and so like they're like a one ply whatever. Um, and then the then like you can use whatever top heads. And Joseph actually showed me that, and it's because those resonant heads can be pesky, you know. And it like Ooh. creates this like insane, perfect, like they just are so easy to tune. And for me, game changing, like I put them on all my drums now, like, and, and I, I just put like regular two plies on the top, like the EC2. I mean, yeah. oh, just regular like G2s. G2s what G makes oh, a G2s head? I, I do what G2s on the top. Yeah, just regular, no, no ECs on the top. Oh, you can get them in a six inch. Dude, those bottom heads are like, Joseph, how did you figure that out? Or that was you? I just. Like, I just went on the Evans website and it was in their yeah. catalog, and then I just decided because you to know get how them. they can get wonky, like like bottom heads can get like those ones, like somehow like are less. I don't know, it's weird. They're like what easier. makes a head resonant? You're saying a resonant head? Well, that, the, that's like, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. top it's, versus it's bottom, the one you resonant don't and batter. Yeah, the bottom so head the is batter resonant. Is the one you beat in the resonant top one's batter. batter. Yeah. yeah. Evans EC Resonant Series features Dude, single ply of 10 millimeter film designed with the ability sick. to correct tuning and consistency <laughs> while offering more centered pitch. <laughs> Increased resonance and dynamic range. This drum head features Evans Level 360 Cheers technology for one ease tuning. So, da, 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 da. That looks nice. I'm going to check those out. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, Spreading the good word. Secret for everybody. Check to this all out. my favorite death metal incredible. drummers. Yeah, I, um, I typically use G2s on the toms. Me too. But, um, yeah. On the Betty kit, I put um the black chromes, dude. Uh, mm -hmm. Like it's just like, oh, cool. and they're even deader. So you tune those down, and they're yeah. You know, we all kind of consciously or unconsciously are, are are trying to go for that late seventies disco tom sound. I think exactly, yeah. You know, where it's just it just sounds like well duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the hydraulic toms, if you you know, obviously, you know, like with the oil in them and all that. And it's like the like fuck? Those, hydraulic those tom? Are the, now you're starting to that's the opposite of which shit, because dude. what happens is the resonance, like like the power from the drum. Hey man, it has the hydraulic goes away. <laughs> yeah, the hydraulics. No, th those are oil. There's like oil in between the plies, like a two ply oil well, in between. I, I guess middle, I should. But, yeah. I guess I should have said that the hydraulics were better than a pinstripe pinstripe because the pinstripe they are. had that oil in there too. So yeah. well, we're getting so this is the nerdiest I think I've ever heard on this show right now. But dude. with gear talk, with gear talk, well, no, but but like, this, I, I love this. This is no, fascinating. I, knew, I never knew. I heard. I never knew about I, that. I, I read an interview about the the drum tech at one point for Danny Carey, like way back, and for from Tool, obviously, and 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 like I guess he used to use the like the hydraulic heads on his toms on like these you know expensive sonar kits, and then like I guess his drum tech was like no. Like you need to use G2s and like figured it like made it like different. Now he uses G2s or whatever. But like basically like it was a, a long article about it. Like why he, he was like not down yeah. with the hydraulics. Like he's like you can get more tone and and power from each drum by like not d deadening the batter head too much. Like basically. Do you guys know where Evans like drum head started? No. Mm -mm. Fucking Dodge City, Kansas, man. I think. Hmm. <sighs> Like, Wait, you I, think it's your opinion? No, I'm 100% oh. sure that Kevin started in Kansas. <laughs> okay. Let's ask Ch Chat GPT what the things are. Chat gonna... GPT. <laughs> It'll just I don't have an account. I thought you were going to say North Korea. I was like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> um, I have a quarry in, down the street, and I think they're in Buena, Buena ah, Park. Roy Burns, is he still there? I have never been there, but I've driven by it, and uh, my school of rock has an 
like connection. So that's what they sell out of the School of Rock catalog. But um, I, I'm an Evans guy because of uh, Behemoth yeah. and Nile and those bands that used them back when I was impressionable. Yeah. I don't know what got me into Evans, but I there was just one day where I just bought a set of Evans heads because, you know, growing up in the era I grew up in, you either played Remo heads or no, you know, is that mm-hmm. kind of a thing it, coming from the Midwest in the 80s? And there's a lot of there's a lot of those opinions. But at one point in time, I put I got a set of Evans G2s and have not gone back since. So. Yeah. Yep. OK, so uh, what about the, the snare, way, though? We've we've not, broken the scared. record. We've broken the record for the longest we've taken. We're almost and we're somebody. almost done. We haven't talked about the snare yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, what I said. That that's fine. That's fine. Keep going, Anthony. No, snare? I, he's because he's like back in my, he's back at this time in my life. I used to do this. It was a good segue, but but okay. the drummers need to know they're no, the drummers. Right. One more. All right, that's fine. <laughs> we're gonna fine. we're gonna that's go fine. here. I want to finish. Well, this is great. I, I don't. I don't care. This, I want to hear this gear talk for sure. Oh. So, so still, snare. What was the next gear talk question then? Snare, 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 and snare. snare head. Particularly. I like the Evans reverse dot power center top. Um, with whatever hazy 300 500 at the bottom whatever. i i have no science on that i have about a dozen snare drums and they all are completely different weird drums uh i think i have the, the <laughs> a uv something on my oh, the UV snare. Too. yeah i have yeah. the uv2 those are cool i have the uv2 on on my reference wood drum and that's what i'm using right now um I don't know. It's like it's U V H D C S double. It's like oh, HDMI yeah. head. You know, like, HDMI. <laughs> it's the 4K drum head. Like, 4K. You know, um, dude, the 8K is coming out next year, dude. <laughs> no, I had. You know what? I had a reverse dot single ply on mm-hmm. my reference yep. steel, and reverse that dot. was completely yeah. lethal. Yeah. So those are lethal. Yeah. R two D two head. I could take a bullet. <laughs> and then the last thing is. The six snare. So I, I have this other memory of you showing me your reference kit when you got that at the Irving Plaza, actually. And mm-hmm. you were like showing me the snare and you're like, dude, this. And then later I worked at a drum shop like in San Jose and I was like, oh, that's the snare that John was showing me. But it's like that. So explain how the ply. So like ply is like how thick like a drum is, like how many like layers of wood or layers of whatever pl- material. Right. And so kind of like toilet paper, you have single ply and two ply. <laughs> exactly, mm-hmm. dude. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect <laughs> analogy. So explain just and then this is the last gear talk question about drums. Explain the the pearl reference, the whole ply system of how that wood goes. Dude, <laughs> it's I think it's me. It was so sick. Dude. It's I my, my my knowledge, you know, slip at this point because I don't know if it's 20 or if it's 22 plies, but it's maple and birch and yeah, the thing is an inch and a half thick about. And so you you look at it and it's yeah, it's just like like a crazy triangle that goes like into like 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 the drum itself, like the wood concaves in and then comes back out. Like mm-hmm. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's um any drum that's that thick, it kind of they kind of they're weird to tune because it's a 14 inch snare drum, of course, but mm-hmm. then you go in you go in an inch and a half so it kind of operates like it 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 operates like a bizarre 11 and a half drum because that's the channel so it's a bizarre drum to tune Mm -hmm. but it's really fucking cool that's i have uh i also have an old mrp snare you remember those guys um no wait so let me real quick to just add to what you just said real quick did the the head stretch over that inch and a half section that you're talking about is that what or it's does four, no it's a 14 inch snare so as far as the head's concerned it's just a normal 14 inch snare okay but it is like that thick the wall the shell wall itself and i know so but the head goes over the top of that wall as picture. well we need a picture dude i'm trying to find i'm i'm, I'm trying to just picture it in my uh, mind. a That's picture of of how the ply i'm like looking on like a pearl reference snare yeah, it's like so insane. To- I oh, represent here we go. the the no, dum dums and the the podcast listeners that don't know. Maybe I'm just the only one. 
<laughs> well, like, hey, there's got to be somebody else out there that has the same question as me. Does it go over that thick layer or does it start on the interior of that? I layer? think that has been. Ex- I, that that, that sounds it? like it's been overly complicated. Oh, here we I go. know I got a picture of it. I think I, I think I found it. Uh, let me share if it'll let me share. How do I share? Where is it? I can't. Oh, present. Is that what it's called? Okay. I don't know. Sorry, my Your question is derailing. Shit. If I can present, I have something to present. Do you guys see anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah we see it. Blamo, you, there it is. You see? Oh shit! I tried to click it, and that was a mistake. Yep. Do you see that? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. It. I see, right, yeah. Cool. On the right. Yep. yep. So that wood, see how that goes in so thick like that? Mm-hmm. It and goes like concaves. <laughs> so that means the head thick. does go over that section too, as well. Yeah, I have to go to the outer rim, that that metal ring that it it that tightens it. Well, that's you know, all the snares and like the hoop and so, but like the like the wood, mm-hmm. like it goes down. It's like a like a ramp. Like it's like it goes kind of inward. Oh, trip. It's not. Yeah, it's not even like centered. How thick it is, right? It it's centered. Like center. The camera that took the picture of it isn't centered. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if you go down da- go down again like you just did and there's another little picture in the center boom right there in the center okay. Jesus. Yeah. There. Yeah. McGee. yeah there's the thicky dude yeah there you go that's right. without a head All on right. it t-h-i-c-c so, dude that thing and, and you told me john at the time you were like it's dude it's it, it's great but it's a one trick pony it's like it's super loud or something I kind of figured it out a little while ago. It's very loud. It's very sharp. It's very quick. Um, and yeah. you know, like I, w- what I was saying earlier was that it's it's such a bizarre shape that it just mm-hmm. requires a little more tuning patience, really. Um, but, but you know, I mean, it's it's a fucking cool drum. You know, I, I it's it's yeah. my main snare here in New York right now. Um, the kit, the That's snare it. that I have at a that's now lives over in Kansas. It's a, it's a reference again, but it's steel. So mm-hmm. it's five, three, five millimeters. It's cast steel and man, it might be louder. Oh yeah. Wow. Fuck I kind of, kind of got into a, a steel or a metal snare drum thing when I was, uh, you know, doing my first rehearsals with hate eternal. And he had the original Tama mm-hmm. Stewart Copeland snare. Oh shit! Ooh, and we were man. just like, "Woo, damn!" So now I have like four metal snares. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude! I love it. Well, that okay. So, what are the differences between metal, metal, and wood then? <laughs> metal is like generally louder and has it has a really nice sound with the snare at the bottom. So, like the Ludwig Superphonic is kind of like the gold standard then of course there's the black beauty mm. like L- ludwig metal snares basically are like the general kind of best snare drum like in like from i don't know like old and then there's like wood snares as a whole different thing but you get that lovely like like milky buzz and everything from metal snares like it's just and then of course the crack is a whole nother you know, i just wheat. find them to be more aggressive mm-hmm. you know wood snares are just going to have a little bit more warmth to them and they're going to have a little more friendly probably friendly yeah. tones to it. sure um you know but there are a, a lot of metal orchestral snares too and you can't really be loud and obnoxious when you're playing an orchestral snare well, yeah sure yeah, you have to be super actually, controlled on this yeah i have a 1976 ludwig acrylate oh sick and okay. that sounds yeah, it's rad a, it's a pretty killer drum it's <laughs> an right. aluminum shell i think how yeah. how loud how loud do you need your snare to be in origin or how how loud do you need it in different contexts like have you ever been in the studio like this snare is too loud or uh vice versa i guess no no can't get too loud um, he's like no it's not no i mean <laughs> look who i'm competing with you know yeah paul ryan has four guitar has four mesa cabinets and two basically 90 90 heads on stage mm-hmm. you know eric rattan has a jcm 800 half stack and a triple rectifier half stack on stage <laughs> these guys play jet engines they don't play <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah totally <laughs> and so yeah so That's the chinas right. have to be up here at their ear level <laughs> right you know? for sure and you 
<laughs> oh man those guys are so loud oh, i want to talk about your symmetrical setup too i don't know if it's too it's early. not that it's symmetrical i don't know if it's too early. early we're an hour in we have so good <laughs> i love it though but when you like you pioneered that in metal i mean it's not perfectly no, symmetrical this is all good yeah i love all this i took yeah. it from terry bozio really oh, i mean man. at least way back in the day when i had like 12 14 18 18 Hi hat, ride ride. It's just like the gotcha. the big line of chinas up top was a was a, a, a Terry Bozio thing. Oh, okay, cool man. And then yeah. I just kind of realized that you know on stage or in a live setting or even in a death metal setting in general mm -hmm. at that tempo, no one's going to be able to tell the difference between an eight inch splash, ten inch splash, twelve inch splash, twelve inch mini china, fourteen inch mini china. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and then bang because somebody has to have a stupid ice spell on the kid <laughs> ice spell I've since fallen out of favor with the ice spell it just it sounds like something else it doesn't it never sounds like part of the drum kit to me mm. what's well, the ice spell which one well, is that one well, how, the big what? cup you know it's the zill bell uh, the, well, no, the, LP, still, uh, the LP yeah, bell that John Merriman used to use. Mm -hmm. you oh, know? Wait, and yeah, yeah he, now the Zill bell, dude. which has to come before every breakdown in existence. Yeah. That's what I have. That's what I could get. I think they just made a dark <laughs> a dark bell, which I'm interested in trying. Dark bell. Uh, that's what they're calling it. Was it called Bong? I've always tripped uh, on people that put those on their ride symbols, like pointing up, and I'm like, Ricky what? from Discord. I tried to copy that. Yeah, with the upside down, the upside down bell. Yeah, the upside down thing. bell on the ride. Yeah, I don't know. I was I always know. like, I, uh, I, a bit. I knew a drummer that starts with a T. He might be in the chat. He had that set up going for a little what you, bit. What are you talking about? You say Troy Fullerton from Seven Savior. I know a drummer <laughs> that his name starts with a T, and he would put a fucking saw blade on his kit. Look at that. Oh, oh yeah, with the Loreno, Loreno, little mm -hmm. TL, TL. Yeah, and he was telling me this funny story about how he would go into hardware stores with one drumstick, and he would be tapping on saw. Blades. Really? Yeah. Ah, oh, it's amazing. No way. You just all ding, ding, ding. It's like. This is this guy with the drumstick, not drumstick, like in Home Depot. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I saw them play with Nile, like you know, when I was six, and, and still in high school at that time, or whatever it was like around, you know. And I was like, Jesus, dude, he's got saw blades on his kit. Like, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> so good, they killed it. It's yeah, like, the can't... the Roto Tom chassis. Hey, Ian. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the Roto Tom chassis works as a good dingling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay what um why why did the standard drum tom sizes change from 12 13 16 to 10 12 16 over the last maybe decade well my personal experience is my tom setup was always 10 12 13 14 on my on my old premiere kit and mm -hmm. i remember being at morris sound in 90 seven either the end of 96 or the beginning of 97 tracking exterminate with angel corpse mm -hmm. and jim morris would come in and he'd tune and i just remember him grumbling about the 13 it's like this is you got to get rid of this 13 i go why just because you have 10 skip an inch 12 skip an inch next door inch 13 it, you can't tune it one of these drums has to be out of tune for this to work right and he's just grumbling about tuning the drums you know and that just kind of stuck in my head. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? He goes, well, I mean, 8, 10, 12, and then 14, 16 makes the most sense, in my opinion, in Jim Morris's opinion. Mm -hmm. And then, sure enough, you know, a few years later, I get on the road, and there's Derek Roddy with 8, 10, 12, 15, which was strange, but we got into that same discussion, and he was in the same point of view, and I'm like, well, oh, cool. So there's that, and there's also just like 8, 10, 12 is kind of like here, you know, where the it just gets bigger and bigger, and the, the faster the faster the drums and the, the bands got, because if you remember like 2000, you know, you had the old trench metal movement, Angel Corpse and Christian and Rebellion and, you know, uh, 
uh, Centurion and all these bands were just getting faster and faster. And mm-hmm. Cryptopsy, you know, Origin put out the second, you know, Origin put out Infinitas, and like everybody was just getting faster. It was a, it was a race for a while. You know, Nile comes out with Chapter for Transforming into a snake. Yep, and it was the first time anybody ever attached 250 BPM to a blast beat. So all of a sudden, oh really? There was that so I think as things got faster. And people just started, you know, considering technique a little bit more because that was really an, an interesting bit because, you know, you know, grindcore, there was basically no technique until Pete Sandoval, right? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Pete Sandoval kind of come out of grindcore, starts playing death metal, and he sort of brings the technique into the death metal, and people just went from there. And I think smaller drum sizes, less, less um, real estate that you have to cover, you know, mm-hmm. My that, question is: Is wait, I, I, with the eight-inch drum, is that a scarier drum? It to is. Hit? It is, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like that's the target practice drum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, but, click, 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 yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, that, and I, I play. You know, I call them the evens ten, or I don't have the eight on right now, but ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, and I actually will put the eight on um, at some point. But uh, it's not just death metal drummers. It's like any standard drum kit sells. Danny Carey had a ten, had an eight ten setup for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so the manufacturers probably decided alongside people like uh, Morris that yeah, this thirteen just it's harder to tune or it doesn't make sense with the other sizes. But I'm I don't want to get too nerdy, but like it's not just <laughs> one inch, two inch. Like it has to be uniform because like you're not just changing uh it's like the the circumference or or the the area right that's changing not so much just like an inch i don't see the the why uniformity has to be so important there um i don't know i think it's yeah. just i think it's more about you know fundamental pitch of the shell and all that kind of stuff because a drum shell has a, has a tone that it wants to sit at yeah and yeah so i think people so the 8, 10, 12, you know, 14 floor thing. Hour late. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We we do a P's Jedi grind. And, uh, what does that yeah. mean? Murray, Murray from uh, Severed, he uh, he doesn't like... Fuck, the, he likes like a he likes, jersey. He, he, likes, he likes uniformity with the podcast. He likes like... <laughs> like he doesn't like when you stray from the path of... What no, you like. Murray, you don't get uniformity. <laughs> no, like a, that's like a not while I'm episode. here. Oh, my <laughs> God. Uniformity. It has to be... <laughs> Would you like to do the podcast in Pro Tools? We can put everything on the grid and the clip. <laughs> no, exactly. dude. I, but we do really want to hear about your your past dude because it, like we we've been talking about the unique aspects of your playing and and the monumental releases that you've been on so we want to know like how that all started and and music love for music is how it starts where did you start getting actually interested in music father was a jazz musician had jazz musicians in the house every day rebelled around the age of 12 got into kiss and iron maiden <laughs> judas priest went from there know. heard van halen oh heard along God. the van halen records that was perfect guys. um heard a slayer record okay i'm gonna cut you off real quick because you said van halen so you've been kind of actually in my eyes you know when eddie van halen started tapping and people were like what the fuck's he doing mm-hmm. when like we're hearing you play like back in the early albums i was like what the fuck's he doing how is he how was he going? So how was he speeding it up so fast? So I feel like there's a link between that Van Halen kind of like secretive kind of like technique. But he had to play a bunch of shows to make money because it's fucking death metal. But um, he would like hide hide like his like, technique from people, you know. And so I mean, is there kind of like a link there, like a finding the new technique or something? To yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's a lot of there's a I mean there's a lot of resident uh, Eddie Van Halen's story is it's deep and it's really sad and it's really awesome at the same time. But yeah, he had like the most crushing, like anxiety issues. He thought he was bad. He thought he was, but when he found this little thing that he did, so yeah, he would turn around. Yeah. Um, but he had also done like nine other things that nobody ever, like he invented the power break. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, Eddie Van Halen didn't, you could say Eddie Van Halen invented the, the two hand tapping but you got to go 
earlier. You got to go further back. You got to go back to Genesis. You got to watch Steve Hackett, who was actually tapping. Yeah. But nobody really gives him the credit for that because he was playing like artsy, weird artsy prog metal. So, no, I the one handed roll is not mine. It's George Flukes, mm-hmm. as okay. far as I am concerned. And he did that on the demo, and I had to learn it. I just happened to be lucky to be there and put it on an album in, in you know, 99. But no, there was always the thing with, with growing up with jazz musicians and, you know, having those guys say so that's already in your, like it from the earliest memories there's yeah. jazz musicians yeah. and jazz going on in the house okay exactly and they didn't look like rock musicians because as i became you know as i understood you know start watching mtv and seeing all these drummers play like all that so that's why i, I was never much of a massive swinger like because mm-hmm. that always looked weird to me but no, musicians like Eddie Van Halen, like Trey from Morbid Angel, you know, these guys that they they almost like intentionally break things to to make shit interesting. And yeah, there's a lot of inf- there's a lot of influence coming from that point of view. I don't really know what I've invented, but in a lot of cases I would see little things that I hadn't seen elsewhere like Brandon Thomas from Denmark watching that guy play um like the little discussions about doing you know double strokes on the feet on the Derek Roddy board you know and that just those little things that I thought were a lot cooler than what was being done in the mainstream so well let's go way before that though bro because I really want to know about like childhood I want you're saying that your your parents or your dad was a jazz musician Mm -hmm. I want to I want some I want I want to find that root of all that stuff in the childhood because it happened early, obviously, if it was just all always around at the house. But kind of like give us that if you can conjure up one situation where you heard something, and you're like, yo, I need to pay attention to this, how old you were and all that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, I was in first grade and we were standing in line at the end of recess and my best friend at the time shannon agan says you got to listen to this band called van halen and he makes really weird noises on the guitar um and at this point i wasn't i wasn't a jazz listener it was just there and Mm -hmm. you know my dad put me in front of the record player and put headphones on and he'd he'd play miles davis records steely dan records and police records for me as i was a kid those were my favorites and you know as grade school and i i remember coming home from school being like something something van halen and my sister was there and she's like "Uh uh-huh that's cool and older sister older sister and Mm -hmm. yeah she got me the van halen 1984 tape Hmm. for my birthday Mm -hmm. or whatever and i wore that thing out Nice. And that's kind of where it went. Um, listened to a lot of Van Halen and kind of got in, and that kind of led into all the hair bands in, in the 80s. And Do you remember being into the percussion more than other aspects of the music by then, or no? It always rooted me out that I couldn't hear the kick drum, the bass drum mm-hmm. on, Kiss, on, on Kiss Records. You mm-hmm. could sense it. I'm like, and right around that point in time, I think I must have, I must have heard something that was like more aggressive and metal that you could actually you know like i don't think the kick drum was really a lead instrument until end justice for all correct Mm -hmm. me if i'm wrong anybody but um it does kick you pretty fucking hard when you're listening to end justice for all like just like the 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 top end on it like the the kick drum is as loud as the guitar and the vocals like when did that totally so you know yeah eight track (laughs) So going through childhood and listening to this stuff, were you thinking about maybe wanting to pursue uh, playing an instrument? That was never a second guess. There was, I mean, that was just, that was the only thing that like was it sense. drums all the time from the beginning. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. It, or it was guitar at one point. I, I had a guitar and I was playing around with that. 
but a friend of mine got better quicker, so I just played drums. Um, that's almost that's almost the Van Halen, you know, Abbott story, but I wasn't related to the guy. But um, no, there was a point. My mom is a nurse, so at one point in time, there was the, the concept of going into the medical field, but mm -hmm. I just kept playing drums throughout high school, and then. Man, I graduated high school. So talk about the I'm first sure drum kit, later. the first drum kit situation. I don't remember what it was. It really? was something. Well, it, it was doesn't. Something a friend it, gave no, to no me. we're out of gear talk. We're out of gear talk. Just first drum about kit I bought getting was a Pearl it, Export. Getting it forever, for whatever, and just being able to sit down on it and being like, oh shit, dude, I got a drum kit now. Yeah, that was a pretty quick transition, I think, to like, because there was a drum kit that was given to me when I was a little, little, little kid by one of my dad's jazz musician friends, and I never played it. Mm -hmm. It just sat in the corner. And then eventually I pulled that thing out a handful of years later, and then all of a sudden I started playing beats, and then I started playing along to Van Halen and Kiss Records. Nice. And Okay, so that goes all the way into high school, obviously. When's the first time you play with other people? Like, Oh, you play guitar? Let's jam or whatever. That was in middle school. Okay. Actually, I had a friend named Sean, and he he was the kid that I referenced earlier that got better at playing guitar because we were both guitar players, and we both had guitars, and he just was able to pick songs up from the radio and play them like that. And I was like, ooh. And so I have a drum kit. We'll set it up tomorrow. And that's kind of where that went. Um, that must have been sixth or seventh grade. Maybe even mm. fifth grade. Um, what year going, was that? I don't fucking know, man. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking. I'm just trying to like. You know, I remember. What was I remember. Popular, you know, on the radio and all that shit at that time. That's. I remember the picture. drum intro from Pound Cake by Van Halen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> being just insanely powerful and just being like, what? And so that was at the very beginning. So. You know, and I think like when it came to extreme metal, 86, no, no, maybe, no, for a lot of carnal knowledge, it wasn't 86. Oh. <clears throat> um, it was in the 90s, but uh, like, I think it was actually Cynic and Carcass that was able to pull me into more extreme music because. Like, How did you come across that, though? My friend Scott Brown. From Kansas, he started. This is high school, and he started. You know, and he was interesting character. He he liked bull thrower. He liked napalm death. He liked yeah. genocide. He just kept asking me questions. I don't know who these bands are. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he kept playing this stuff for me, um, but I couldn't. He was playing napalm death carcass, like peel sessions carcass, mm -hmm. and like and like the first benediction record or something like that i couldn't make anything out of it and yeah check out my heart on there um at death's door two and the aboric form song came on and all of a sudden like oh these guys are actually i could actually i could hear what they were playing mm -hmm. so hearing that right. yeah. and necroticism by carcass and hearing that and like whoa mm -hmm. now i get it then i could backtrack into napalm death backtrack into deicide backtrack into monstrosity morbid angel Right, and all that, and yeah. then yeah, Covenant came out, and it's just weird how something has to Damn. click, and then now you're ready yep. to listen to all that other stuff. Door is open, yeah. it's just yeah. <clears throat> at death door. And I was 10 in 86 because I was born in 76. There you go, wrong, Ian. Wrong, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Ian. <laughs> Damn it, Ian. What about Rain and Blood? Did that make an impression? Not until I heard um no, it didn't at first, right? If and if you think that's fucking sacrilege, go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not, I not heard, a leading question in any sense. I heard um Seasons in the Abyss first, actually. Okay. Okay. And then backtracked, of course. Um, Seasons in the Abyss is still one of my favorite. I mean, the second half of Seasons is amazing. <clears throat> Seasons yeah, in the Abyss. 
season. That, yeah, that my, was my. That was Joel's uh, AIM, dude. Yeah, back in the day. Was, I mean, that's a SOD. They did like a little LP called Season mm-hmm. the Obese. And I'm like, oh, I have to pick a new screen name for AOL. How about <laughs> Season the Obese? <laughs> you have mail. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm the only male. All right. Okay, so <laughs> that's my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so Covenant is Covenant is Covenant the all time death metal yeah. coming like uh, before we get to that I know what, album. I know what you I, I want him to answer that, but I also want to know how you stumbled across death metal. My friend Scott Brown, who I was in high I was a freshman in high school and he was a sophomore. Oh, uh, it's the same guy. Okay. Yeah, and he just kind of like walked up to me one day and he, I had a, a Ludwig sticker on my Trapper Keeper. Trapper Keeper, shout out, dude. Yeah, there you go, bud. <laughs> and um, he just started asking me questions about drums, and I'm like, I didn't have any answers. And then I had an Iron Maiden sticker on my Trapper Keeper next week, and he's like, oh, Iron Maiden. Cool. <laughs> Do you like Cannibal Corpse? Yeah, I was going to say um, <laughs> it's, just, it's how it goes for everybody, you know? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's, uh, One-upping. Yeah, yeah. The, Actually, the... he didn't ask me if I liked Cannibal Corpse because I saw this was the era when I when Butchered at Birth first came out, and I saw that in the back of uh, the back of a magazine, and it was the Butchered at Birth album cover, and it just said "completely fucking sick," and I remember just <laughs> staring at it, <laughs> terrified. Yeah, like what the fuck is that? Um, <clears throat> You know, fast forward thirty years later, and they're like the nicest dudes in the scene. So right, right, pretty funny. Yeah, we've had uh, the pl- privilege of uh, talking to Paul, and he was great, dude. Paul oh, is yeah. such a down to earth, regular dude. You, Did you know? talk hockey with him? Um, that, that we've done a hundred. Now we're on one fifteen, bro. You're gonna hit me on. I don't even know what number it was. You should have talked <laughs> hockey with him. Oh yeah, that's we had we had a good guys. time, but when I met this guy, from guys Buffalo, how do you not talk hockey with a guy from Buffalo? Because I don't <laughs> fucking watch hockey, bro. Okay, <laughs> that's a good Fair. excuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but the, there's like bands like I remember when I first met Cephalic when I was in high school, maybe junior high school. They were it was them and Soylent Green, and oh, they yeah. had they ah, had like so a right. they had like a hockey setup for the back like, outside. And they would just set it up and just start fucking like goals and shit and like fucking slap shots at each other. Like fucking they were way like they needed to practice. It wasn't like they like to watch the sharks or something. It's like, no, we need to get our slap shot down. They were like <laughs> really going deep. deep in it was shit. Mighty Ducks that made me get into hockey, dude. And I did I did the street hockey situation. You remember the little pucks that had the the balls in them that they're like, you can use these as street pucks. Oh, yeah. You know? And we would do the, uh, I forget yeah, that one where you called. put it up on the side. It's like the Happy Gilmore <laughs> yeah, golf cut. It yep, like doesn't yep, really work, but totally, dude. The knuckle puck, dude. That's knuckle what it puck, is, dude. dude. Yo, guys, I think M. Gilbert just gave up his relapse message board alias. Oh, uh, what? Is Bam! It? Look at that. <laughs> oh <laughs> no! <laughs> Facts. Grinder. Oh, for anybody that knows, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> look at him. No. <laughs> Oh, that's rough. Oh, that's great. I dude, shouldn't have put that me. one up there. That was not me. Just kept it. <laughs> yes, that's, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so I John, that, that took <laughs> that path took you to Morbid Angel, basically. What you're saying is, yeah, it kind of did. Um, you ran well, me right. You ran you right into Pete Sandoval, and you you were like, Pete defeats the shit. I didn't really absorb Pete, uh, Morbid Angel and Pete Sandoval until I joined Angel Corpse and Gene Palabiki really kind of drilled that into my head and explained to me what was going on. Mm-hmm. So once Gene explained to me what was going on, then just... Yeah. And I knew I was incapable of playing death metal drums. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, at that 95. time. At that time, because <laughs> you're very capable right now. I, it was... <laughs> But okay, but then malicious intent and and that demo in '95, like how did all that come together? Like we like to hear about those. Malicious those... intent was a band that I had from '93 to '96. 
mm-hmm. and it was some local dudes from Lenexa, Kansas, and they they were the they were ripping. It was like the only band that was wa- wanted to do blast beats and play really fast, like Slayer riffs and all that kind of stuff. And we went into the recording studio. We, we got like six songs put together. And we went in the recording studio, and at this time, I had my big Pearl export kit kind of get back really quickly for Gear Talk. And it was 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, over two 24-inch kick drums. Hell Damn, yeah. dude. That's a widespread right there. That's a Lombardo. Widespread. And uh, and it was funny because I didn't, I had never triggered before. But I'm like, can we trigger the kick drums? And the guy's like, yeah, sure. So what he does is he puts an SM57 in each kick drum. And then he plugs the SM57s into the the DM, into the D4. Mm-hmm. And that's how we oh. triggered the kicks on that thing. And it worked. Damn. You know, it was good. It was crazy. Uh, so that demo came out. Uh, it came out. We handed it out. And <laughs> I know that Joey Jordison from Slipknot had one because he remembered the red version. Hmm. And okay. Joey would call the house and ask for my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> and i remember her being on the phone she goes do you have any more of the red tapes i go no he goes he's asking about the red demo i'm like oh wow but just calling the landline yes yeah, <laughs> he would call the landline no, like no. old school style dude yeah it was really yeah. weird um he's from the tape trading days come on give him some tape trading yeah, yeah, days yeah. in the midwest it was a small circle and, yeah. but I'm trying to remember. That's that's kind of the malicious intent story in a in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. So was yeah. that your first like somewhat pro feeling outfit that you were? Dealing There's nothing with? really pro about it. We just well, I we mean, were a you local guys band. Went no, the first pro band was and Angel all that Corpse. kind of shit. The first pro so band that was, was Angel before Corpse. Um, malicious intent. Then Angel Corpse wasn't. No. Oh, okay. No, malicious so. intent was my 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 teenage band that I played in after school. No, okay. I'm sorry. I'm saying the first time you felt that whole like, oh, we're putting a release together. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, that was really yeah. cool. That was like going into the unknown for the first time, driving my car to a recording studio to set up my drums. Totally. You know, I had no idea what was going on. Right. Okay. So then, it, but from that, Angel Corpse caught wind of you from that or f- something else? Some guy at a party had the malicious intent demo and played it for Gene, I think. And then Gene looked my name up in the phone book and called me. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. I can't quite remember. (laughs) And he called me up and said, oh, total death metal. And so I'm like, okay, well, uh, he goes, want to come over? So I went over to his house that night, hung out with him. And two days later, moved my kit in and started that. Wow. And so how, t- tell us a little bit about that, like getting into that, that um, outfit. And also that was comfort- interesting. That was interesting because there was a band from Kansas called order from chaos that we had heard about. And, you know, it was like, if you look at order from chaos today, you know, they're extremely problematic with some of their fucking topics, I'm sure. But back then, it was just, whoa, this is crazy Order from Chaos band. And so one of the dudes from Order from Chaos was in that band. And Gene's like, yeah, I've got so-and-so from Order from Chaos in here. I'm like, oh, weird. So I went over there, hung out with those guys for an afternoon. And then, like, two days later, moved my kid in. We started practicing. And we just bang, 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 bang. Just nailed, like, nine songs out in the course of three weeks. Jesus. Um, tracked a little four song demo on a four track that was way too hot it was so funny it sounded awful it was just but somehow Hervé from Osmos liked it and offered us a record contract and so there you go go to recording studio record a eight song record and that was Hammer of Gods put us out on tour Um, went home and started working on the next record immediately um, worked on those songs, got down to Mora Sound, realized I was way over my head. And yeah, Public Assassin was killing. And that's when the the story of like recording Exterminate came out and they had to like completely rebuild the kick tracks and all that shit. 
you were saying got on fired the, from Angel Corpse. Cheers. You were saying on the Cobra Crab episode that uh, Morbid Angel was in the Studio A yeah. recording formulas while you were yep. in Studio B. Yes, and this this connects in with Malefic Throne real nicely because we drove from Kansas all the way down to Tampa. Gene had already lived there for a while, but he was living in Kansas at the time, so he already had a network down there in Tampa. So we went down there and we went straight to Lee Harrison's house and watched Monstrosity practice. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen anything like oh, that yeah. before. Right. And and um, and then yeah, we went to sleep. Woke up the next day, loaded into Morris Sound, and yeah, more uh, Angel Angel Corpse was tracking. We were tracking in Studio B with. Jim Morris, while Morbid Angel was mixing in Studio A with Tom Morris, and nobody had seen or heard Steve Tucker yet. Mm -hmm. Damn. So we heard it first, and Whoa. that was pretty cool. And so lots of talking, you know, everybody getting along. It was really fucking cool. I met all the Morbid Angel guys. I met the Monstrosity guys, the Cannibal Corpse guys, uh, you know, a handful of other dudes. Tony Lariano was down there. Um... <clears throat> Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South, came walking into the recording studio. <laughs> and, yeah, the problem was is I just didn't have the ability to play the songs at that point in time. So they did what they did to get the songs to sound right on the record. And then I went home. And a couple weeks later, got the call that Tony was going to be taking my place in the band. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, uh, okay, you know. So, yeah. And well, that was that. You know, I, I never faulted them for firing me either because I was not practicing. I was not taking it seriously and all that shit. So that was there was never any any ill will from me about that. Right. Um, I don't know why some of the people in that band needed to carry that and drag my name through the mud back mm. then, but they're not yeah. around anymore either. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of goes. I mean, when that stuff happens, you know, people have to have explanations for it. They're like, oh, I don't know, like he fucking. Didn't and do most people anything. most people want to put it on somebody else, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, for the my Tony Lorena or Loriano, I don't know, Loriano, I call him Loriano. Loriano. Um, story <laughs> was that he stole my shot in the spout in the the shower line once at, in the the medley in fucking Montreal, and I have never let that go. He just stepped right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, uh, man, I've told that story before. I was like, I was sitting there with my towel. We we're playing like the haunted and like. I don't know. Just, I think it might have been a summer slaughter or something like that. But like the haunted was headlining, and I'm disgusting. I'm gross. I'm like, oh fuck! I found the shower, and I have my towel there. I'm all like excited, yeah, and then yeah. like I just turn my head for a second. The door opens, and he just goes, runs right in. I'm like, motherfucker! motherfucker I, <laughs> like for the rest of my life, I'm like, fuck! I am <laughs> mad at you. We need to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll go like, through the channels and see if we can get him on the pack on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Actually, we should do that, and then I'll, I'll bring that up to him. I like confront him about the shower stealing. <laughs> Maybe he'll let you use the shower at his house or something. <laughs> I'm gonna that shower actually... the whole podcast. I'm just gonna go in the like when the podcast starts. I'm just gonna shower. That would be the hurt. most epic apology ever, dude. It's like Joel's like, "Hey, live from fucking Tony's shower, dude." <laughs> I'll just bring my webcam in the shower and I'll just be like, obviously, like from, you know, chest up and just fucking just shower like while we're talking like, yeah, what? Dude, didn't hear you because, you know, I'm showering. <laughs> One time you <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> shit. Well, keep okay. going. I know. <laughs> I'll keep the, going. This, the, on this exterminate record. So fixing it up, it's it's is it uh, mostly just like replacing the kick yeah. tracks yeah. with with program drums or whatever? Yeah. That's like what every band does these days. So for that to be I mean that's what everyone does. It just uh, sounds like Yeah, everyone does it to an extent, but not to this mm. fucking extent. And not I when see. all of a sudden you didn't even really know that that was a thing and then you're watching it go down and it's your track. Yeah. And in the meantime, your uh, your band members are out there going, "You're pathetic." <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> but mm. um no, it, it um it's like, that's, that's fuel it, to uh it was a definite push trial, forward. By, trial by fire kind of moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know. mean like you know, took it took it from there. I just I just only returned to that just because it's um it's such a widespread practice now that it doesn't seem to carry nearly any weight to you know to me or anybody. Like I have recorded entire albums without a kick drum, just knowing that 
I could not even play it if I tried because it's at 280 or whatever, and it's really? not worth trying to play it clean. You yeah. just recorded your hands. That's it. Yeah. Whoa. Play it on a pad. I mean, I recorded the MIDI off the pad, um, mm-hmm. and it sounds legit when you like just play that track. It's like okay, like it's clearly, you know, it sounds good, but like you know, you're going for something else. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm at the point. Well, that was kind of you know the thing is like, hey, I'm gonna learn how to play fucking learn how to play yeah. after i got kicked out of the band i was like never again fuck all these guys fuck tampa they're all a bunch of dickheads blah, 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 blah. um and eventually i joined another band then joined another band and met paul ryan from origin and you know we and he had a much different perspective on it so i was able to approach again and yeah ever since then it's just like i'm never gonna record something i can't play live mm. been that way ever since Dude, that actually was a key moment in your career because it you didn't you, something happened and you're like I don't want this to ever happen again and I got my ass kicked, you, you know. It's it like pushed that you was to the beginning of my career. I got fucking Right. And I think that's actually mud. great because it 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 you know, we were talking about how other people would react to certain things. Most people would quit when that happens but you actually took that and ran with it and became john longstreth dude well it's not how many times you can get hit it's how hard you can get hit and get back up right Isn't exactly you said uh, yeah yeah definitely. It is, that's <laughs> that's exactly it dude football football references we were trying to get those all out before <laughs> oh yeah the chiefs are gonna win that's that done done i agree with you Sorry, you know, and it's, <laughs> and you know, and we're playing the Eagles. That's Eric Rattan's team. Oh, I know, I know. No, he he <laughs> messaged me like when we got like our our offensive coordinator went to be a, a coach over there. I was like, fucking got your coach, dude. This guy's like, he's still like, I love the, the fucking Philadelphia style of like talking shit because they talk shit so aggressively, and it just makes me happy. I just <laughs> I get happy about that when people are like, actually I watched, down. Yeah. I watched Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we were on tour somewhere. He had the laptop in one hand and he's loading gear with the other hand. <laughs> and the Eagles are winning. Mm. And he's so happy and he's just ripping gear up the cabinet. <laughs> boom. Guitar head. <laughs> boom. Bass drum. <laughs> boom. Laptop. It was wonderful. It's a yeah, new level of strength. From yeah, it was something, man. <laughs> yeah. Hulkamania is live and well. Well, I. Uh, y- <laughs> I'm glad they were winning because if they were losing at that time, that equipment probably would have not lasted. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't you know, need to worry about that. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. I hope, okay, he's not so loading, talk- I hope he's not loading a van during the during the Super Bowl. Yeah, February twelfth. I hope he doesn't play a show or something. <laughs> is it February twelfth? Okay, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, meeting Paul. So tell us about that. Man, he was just he. I met him at a show. Him and Jeremy, because you know they they had Origin at the time, and George had kind of given him the slow fade at this point. And they were handing out demos, and they're like, "Here's the demo," and I'm like, "Whatever." Went home and listened to it. And I was like, "Whoa, holy mm-hmm. fuck!" Yeah. And got to talking with the guy, and I'm like, "I just can't." I kind of told him about what went down, you know, in Tampa, and this is only two years previous, right? Because he's like, I know you, you're the Angel Corpse guy. And I'm like, well, I was, but, and, uh, mm-hmm. so we started working on these things. He'll just, so we'll, we'll just slow it down and repeat it over and over again. And we did. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And to get that, yeah. That. Just yeah. drill it in. Just drill it in. And, you know, from there, I kind of stumbled upon other techniques to kind of, you know, get me further. And yeah. Who, so did you, how'd you, Come across the gravity blast technique. George did that on the demo. So was it George himself that showed you the technique? No. Paul actually told me how he did it. He said, yeah, I think he goes like this. And I just, (laughs) he kind of does a thingy or something. (laughs) I'm like, is he going like that? He's like, yeah. And I'm like. Okay, go home with that. <laughs> Mess with that for a couple of weeks, and sure enough, it uh, it worked. Eventually, I'm like, and it was really slow. I'm like, this is gonna be terrible. 
I don't want to work on this, but yeah. No, dude, uh, this is this is a uh, what I love about getting ready for these episodes is I get to, especially for something like this where we're talking to you, I get to go back to something that I truly have nostalgia for, and those first the, it, that first self titled origin record is for me personally like the perfect speed dude i like, think it's slow man i know but it's <laughs> it's, i know but like it's we left the studio going me it's a little slow i know but i love i love the way that you sound on that record because that speed really highlights what what you're doing you know mm-hmm. and i know that um you do crazier shit later on in your career but i'm just saying for that that record specifically for me at that point in time. Yeah. And, 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 and talking about the heavier aspects of origin too, it, it, it really shows on that album for me and that speed just, uh, you get rattled. It, when you get too fast with the gravity blast, it becomes a hum. You it's know what I'm it's impossible as some of the tempos I'm trying to hit it these days. You know? Yeah, exactly. But back then you still get to be, you get to feel the vibration of it, you know? So that's just me being the old guy. Now I'm just being the boomer. The, guy drums, the drums were really woody, woody sounding on that record. Mm-hmm. That was a man. That was a, 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 a 14 by three and a half Pearl free floater with a K Fallon's head on it. You know, I don't even know what that is. K. <laughs> Fallon is a marching head. If you put a marching oh, okay. head on a on a regular snare drum, you're an idiot. But I did, and I broke lugs <laughs> off of it. But you yeah, know, is that yeah. is there is three by five? Does that qualify as piccolo snare? It's a piccolo, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like boop, and yeah, yeah. piccolos are fun to tune a little bit lower because they kind of go funk if you tune them, tune them, tune them a little bit lower and. Interesting sounding drums. If you do yeah, weird yeah. things, or you just tune them up real high, and then you just sound like Dave Matthews Band. But <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, three eleven. Ew. <laughs> Ew. The hard yeah, hard snare. I mean, do you so okay outside of metal? Like, um, what what are you listening to? Like, because I know that you know I'm I was today trying to buy, uh, Depeche Mode tickets, but they were about a thousand dollars a piece. So I was like. Get Actually, to. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and skip so this. Yeah, but... I listen to a lot of rock and roll these days, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, if I'm just hanging around the house, it's I'm probably listening to Black Sabbath, Priest, or Thin Lizzy. I'm pretty much nice. stuck there. I got a handful of jazz records I really love. Thank mm-hmm. you. And um, ooh, water and tea. Are the jazz records um, you discovered on your own or uh, linked to pops? Both. Yeah, both, mm-hmm. you know, and not to mention, I for the long for I mean, it's working in a, in a music school for a long time. So, you know, dealing with a lot of, you know, musicians there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What kind of Miles Davis eras are you are you doing? Foreign more is my favorite. OK, I don't even know what era that is, but it's um, it's got Tony Williams on it. And the story goes is they had this gig set up and Miles was already just gacked on heroin and. <laughs> <laughs> shows up in a sports car, gets out, goes into the gig, and says to the rest of the band, I've donated the proceeds to charity. <laughs> no one's getting paid. <laughs> and so everybody was pissed. And so Four and More is really interesting because it opens with So What, which is what opens um, Kind of Blue. blue. Yep. But it's like 15 BPM faster. It's like... Mm-hmm. Da, 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 da. So the whole album is just... Oh, it's a rip fest. It's like probably the most ripping battle jazz records that exist. That and VSOP, the quintet, that's a great one. Smoking at the half note, Winton Kelly, it's a great one. I've never heard of battle jazz, but I immediately, that's I, an uptake that, right When there. you said that too, I was like, hmm, I need to get into battle jazz. I'll give you a list of records, man. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, yeah, it's just dudes are just I think it's probably when, like, they all really got into cocaine. (laughs) 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 Oh, I mean, like, especially the boundaries of this feeling. That uh, that hard bop era from I think late forties, fifties, 
like Stan Getz and and crew. I mean, they were fucking flying. I really enjoyed insane. that style. Dizzy, Dizzy, and uh, and those guys. Yep. Um, there's one record I have that's just ding 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 I mean, it's kind of like Whiplash. Is kind of like turn that into a mainstream. Who is it that did the art of bop drumming? There's an album or a, a is that Art Blakey. Oh. That's art. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's art. Yeah. Blakey yeah. Sure. yeah. That that uh that stuff's very entertaining dude to watch being played they're like hard bop yeah yep. i i love i love bop drumming for sure dude I, bap. Bap. i wish bap. i could, i wish we saw more of it in death metal to mm-hmm. be honest i don't know how you can really incorporate it the tastefully. jazz the jazz metal i guess lil from thing. from defeated he could yeah you can consider some of his styles coming from bop that Lil Gruber, that dirty Lil Gruber. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely got the mindset for that. He or he Lil probably, Lily. I just saw him last week. It was great. Um, yeah, nice. Oh, yeah. And... yeah, I wish I I could. I had an opportunity and I fucking couldn't do it, dude. Bruh. Anybody who was at Blue Lagoon, I I hope you had a good time in San, Santa Cruz. Yeah, I just saw him in Berlin maybe three days ago. He was already off tour, but. He come and hung out, but like, the whole thing with jazz and metal is it's really interesting. It, it's because a long time ago somebody referred to Death Spell Omega as black and jazz. And I kind of got angry at that. You yeah. Because mm-hmm. I never I never understood like you go to a metal concert to watch four or five people execute what you've heard on the record, right? Mm-hmm. You buy the record, and if they get on stage and if they hit that record they hit those songs like a pinch faster and then it's on the album and they drag the slow parts down just a little bit you might catch a couple of inconsistencies here but you know you've just watched these dudes execute what was on the album right and it's a presentation yep you go to watch a jazz you go watch a jazz show and you kind of go in to watch a conversation you kind of go in to watch a handful of people Look at each other, communicate, and feed off of each other, and work exactly. off of each other. So exactly, yeah. So in that, in that concept, jazz kind of can't work in metal. Yeah, and if no, it does, all the metal heads are just pissed because then all of a sudden <laughs> the metal heads are like, "Ooh, jam band." Boo, I guess the fundamental, the <laughs> fundamental aspects of jazz can work, but really those. A lot of this, you know, and so they, they repeat it like like a presentation, like he's saying, not like I mean, communicate like a conversation. If you got like a band show. like in, Imperial Triumphant, that is actually a, a quintessential um, yeah, example well, of black and jazz, where you have this improvisational aspect mm-hmm. to your music. And I'd love to have any person from that band on. I'm gonna work on Kenny. Maybe we'll see Kenny soon. Um, you, should, you should get Kenny in there. He's great. He's he's a fucking he's one of the most unique drummers I've ever heard. And I've been in this shit for close to 25 years now. And and that dude, his style just doesn't there isn't really anybody who like plays like that for me. And um, so but yeah, that that improvisational aspect of jazz is that that true aspect of jazz that you're talking about it, if if you were to incorporate that into metal it would be something totally different than what people most people say is jazzy metal you know well the improvisational thing can get you in trouble as it has with me in the past because you start doing different things on the drum kit and all of a sudden it doesn't quite work in brutal death metal because it's such a I don't want to say rigid structure, but it's like if you start, hey, I'm just going to hit these fucking upshots on this China here all of a sudden and all this, the guitar. What are you doing this for? You know, consistency is key when it comes to, you know, metal, I think. So, yeah, you can do little things here that are different, but you really kind of got to stick to the script in order to keep the entire band on track on stage. Otherwise, a lot of people just think you're being inconsistent and being sloppy. Yeah, I think you're kind of like improv. You can see the improv and see the look back. See the this stage. Was a conversation I had with John Gallagher from Dying Fetus. Mm-hmm. Yep, and he yep. was just like, "Hey, man, mm-hmm. can you just yeah. like play the same thing every night? I know it's boring, <laughs> but 
we're kind of relying on you to be the foundation. And I was just like, yeah, I can do that. And I just remember that <laughs> clicking. And I'm like, damn, that guy's cool. You know, <laughs> the very, be very beginning of, 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 of my run with Thetis. And he just kind of like, okay, sure. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was a good, that was a good lesson. So totally dude. And, and yeah, to be a chameleon in certain aspects is why you've done so many great records that are all totally different styles of music, you know? So I really want to get into how you became that though. Like wh was it that one specific, the angel corpse thing that pushed you to get to where you're at, you know? Is that really that main thing, or what, were you already on your way to that before that? Well, the Angel Corpse thing just made me want to be able to play death metal correctly. Yeah, you and know? I don't mean to bring bring it back to that because I know all right, it's, it's a well known story, but I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I ended up, I just kept wanting to try other things, so I had a quick little foray into hardcore when I was when I joined the Red Core for a minute. And that was weird. Yeah. Um, what what era was that? Was that Red the first Cord album? was Red Cord was two thousand four. It would have been between fused together and revolving doors and, client. and clients. Okay, yeah, they were. Was that writing. really hardcore though? Was that? It seemed like it was kind of progressive, weird avant garde metal. It wasn't like it was in the hardcore scene. No, I would call it. Band. It was core. You know, it was I like, would definitely call core the cores it. in there. And if if you look at deathcore, like how people describe, you call it deathcore because it's kind of more death metal than hardcore, but it's got hardcore elements. I think that red chord was like this thing that had more hardcore elements at times, but they were more death metal at times. Was, there was no deathcore back then. There was no. It was only like no. your hardcore or your death metal. It was like there's no deathcore. And, had not been established when Fused Together came out. That was just like a weird... Yeah. Well, the, the Red trippy... Ford thing, it, like, it was the... Um, some metal and hardcore festival v DVD that Red Cord was on that I first watched it. So it was already, like, mixing core and, and death metal at that time. I mean, but they that were was fused between door and the whatever that album fused together revolving doors. Yeah. When I was in that band, they were just really big Dillinger's Gay Plan and Crowbar fans. Right. Interesting. I think they were just kind of. I don't. I, when I say core, it was just maybe it was just it was more of a Massachusetts Boston feel in that band. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like and Worcester kind of feel. Yeah, exactly. And the bands that we went out with were, you know, what was going on. There was a lot more, a, a lot of emo shit was happening at that point in time. Like the hairdo was happening and there was a lot of yeah. hardcore. Everybody was playing a four piece, you know, with the flat symbols and just smacking the China, dun, dun, dun. China, 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 mm -hmm. a lot of that. Um, and then after, yes, because there was like a, a really quick span where I did the skinless record in 2003 went out with and then i filled in for exhumed for a couple of tours and then i went from exhumed to the red cord for a couple of tours and then i filled in for dying fetus for a tour and then reconnected with paul and then rejoined origin gotcha so, so in between crowd. the time was when james was playing drums yes okay. so were you discovering these bands as you were right. getting gigs or did you already know about these bands before you played with them no i already knew about exhumed and dying fetus and but the, cord, but red the red cord. cord was a new thing. A buddy of mine named Dean was like, you need to go play drums for the red cord. I've got a connection. Go. And I was like, okay. And I did. And <clears throat> nice. Yeah. So that was quick. I went up, uh, did some rehearsing with them, wrote two songs with them, did a tour with them. And then we decided to, we decided to exit from there. Because... Those two songs, did either one of them make it on clients? uh ant-man which was actually already written before i got in there but ant-man and hospice residence i think okay. were the two songs that i was helpful with that nice nice clients is a killer record dude so the, it, being able to contribute to any part of that is it was an I, interesting I, time it was different yeah. because like the shows were different because nobody drank nobody partied 
Yeah. But they all bought like, you know, you go to a metal show and at the time I was used to a dude buying four or five beers and a couple of shots and a t-shirt and a CD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And went to these red core shows. And I can't remember the other bands. There was some band that had like the, the, the address to the Simpsons or, <laughs> and then some other band. I don't know. They were very, very, very sad, sad boy, hardcore, but like all the fans were both, they were younger and they didn't drink any alcohol. So they bought four t-shirts and three CDs and a poster. Nice. Yeah. 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 Like, Whoa. Awesome. <clears throat> and the crowds were, That's right. the crowds were a lot more pleasant because they weren't drunk. Yeah. The crowds were also a lot more shitty because they were sober. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. The double whammy. Like policing yeah. each other kind of thing. Like Definitely it was like, some oh. double whammy shit happening. Yeah, and like, yeah. like, culture crew existed at that point in time or whatever uh, mm -hmm. carriage crew or yeah something. crews that was the thing back in the day it was, it was like, like a sober crews. crew that would beat the fuck out of people and yeah carve their drinking nests. a beer yeah that's yeah. ridiculous dude. courage crew i think <laughs> courage I don't know. crew i'm gonna get beat up now courage crew <laughs> <laughs> Do you think crazy, a lot of those yeah. crews are still surviving? Parkway Drive like... and Evergreen Terrace. Thanks, Chris. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sure they're they're still thriving in their little bubbles. I mean, Red Cord yeah. got back together recently. They did a show and they had a big old American flag logo. So, yeah. I mean, guys, a uh, guys, a police officer now, right? Isn't he? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Of a, a, a death metal herb. I, got, I think of him as a kind of a death metal singer, but as a, just he jumping is. to that line of work just like you know like it's that was very actually, interesting that was actually a vocalist um i was wanting to hear in the like just straight brutal death metal realm i wanted to see guy do a side project where it was like some suffo influence yeah, shit dude's you know? got a dude's got a killer voice no doubt about it killer definitely definitely I mean, in the deathcore realm, it'll be like him and like Phil from Whitechapel or something. Like, see him do a actual death metal album, you know, like straight ahead, not deathcore. Just because a lot of death metal singers, like the newer ones that are coming out that we put on the show, they're like, "Oh, Phil is a big influence." And I'm yeah. like, I knew he was a great singer because you know, of the tours we did them, but I didn't know like he's now influencing a lot of death metal singers, like coming forward now of just like his big lines and pair sentences he does. In one breath, kind of thing. It's like that's the new gravity blast doubles kind of thing for singers, you know. Big old full circle, isn't it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. that, and that that kid that's in um Lorna. Lorna Shore, probably. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um I haven't you know, heard that enough. band, but I've heard I've been seeing that name a lot lately. Lorna Shore. <laughs> we toured with them, they were nice dudes. I didn't get much out of their music. I don't quite know. I think it's it strikes me as a lot of demo worker with with hardcore moments. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That's what I thought. Mm. Yeah, and that's about where I can. That's where I go with it. Okay. For me, I think there's they're, they're like I feel like it's a it's a flavor of the week a little bit. Like it might if unless they can change it up from that to something completely different, it's gonna kind of the the it's gonna run out. You know, if they, they can't keep doing the demo like same song with like the thing the keyboards in the beginning. And like going into the super fast and like they'll a big probably, breakdown. They'll probably simplify, you know, because yeah, like because yeah. they kind of appeared at that level, you know, they kind of like appeared at top level demo, mm -hmm. totally, you know, with like with the core aspect. And that's like, where do you go from there? I mean, I don't right. know. Yeah, I don't. Maybe they'll maybe they'll just take a complete left and just do like a skate thrash record. <laughs> yeah, do like a radio head album. <laughs> that'll be interesting. I mean, you know. Basement sessions. Yeah. Kind of. That would That'd actually be sick. really sick, dude. I would, I would back that. Yeah, I would respect yeah. that if they just like I went want... to a completely different genre. They're like, we're gonna do this. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, I want... you left all that behind, huh? I want so... them to do like they do like these fucking hyper blasts for like a short period. I want those longer. You want Cause... extension. But also, you hit a point where it becomes like unphysical. Like you just think like a human's not doing this. Um. And so they have to kind of keep it within the realm of like physical embodiment. So it's a tricky fucking tightrope mm -hmm. to walk. Well, right. um, yeah, there are certain bands. There, there are bands out there that are just 
so perfect on stage and you know like you said you got to keep it you can't go so far before everybody's just like this is so obviously not being played mm -hmm. and a lot of the you know, track bands it it bugs me because sometimes I've, I've i've heard a lot of these guys you know sound check and if it's not like the guitar cabinet's not moving air Mm -hmm. it doesn't yeah, yeah. sound like a live amp no totally that's that's, a, that's it kind of sounds the... like a really loud cd and that's something yep. that i think works in a much bigger bigger venue exactly mm -hmm. i don't think like, that works in small clubs very well like a fractal going directly to the the pa versus like having a, a tube amp pushing air mm -hmm. to people and and the band on stage and the drummer that's like well, even so i think if you push a, if you put a fractal into a into a fucking cabinet a tube amp. Yeah, it works. But I when you know, like the backing track thing is like, you guys can't hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, you can't hear the like the loud stereo thing. And that's, you know, that's my my only real bitch about it. well it's, it's the bitch that i'll share here about it. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, just in general, like, there's there's got to be the like the next million dollar inventions got to be somehow to get like even when like when you're going a million miles an hour and, and playing super fast and you you've known the albums forever and you know every fucking change but when you're live it's so fast sometimes it turns into mm -hmm. you gotta like f there's got to be like a technology that i'm like oh, like dreaming about which is like because i'm i'm de half deaf too so I, it's a big problem for me but i'm like having like sound bars on each row or something so it hits everyone equally so it's not like a big bouncing noise fest with the sound waves bouncing everywhere because there's the you guys are like i mean bands that are going super fast are nailing it but the thing is the room depends on what you're gonna hear you know what i mean well i hate to put this negativity out there yeah. but Shit. all you gotta do is look at the silent raves Oh yeah, yeah. No, I know. I was saying the same thing. I was like, just fucking, just you can you can do a fucking sound check, get all the levels perfect, give everyone silent rave like headphones, and it will sound the best. But it will be, it's one of those things when you watch a silent rave and you don't have the headphones on, you're like, what the fuck is going? On? But that <laughs> is there is the interaction between people you go to shows with or people that you meet that are is lost in that uh, silent rave atmosphere because once you take a, a ear off then you you are open to the actual surroundings but now the new technology in. should be like a like a vicinity kind of like microphone thing we're like if you're close to people you can talk to them through like a thing mm -hmm. i'm going way too deep with it <laughs> but like, if, you're if you're like within like six feet you can hear everyone talking around you and like well going a little far with it but it's all I, good. I'm, I'm not a huge audio guy but i did just read. go to a regular show, dude. The, the Grateful Dead <laughs> fucked around with this in the 70s as they were expanding. Uh, they were trying to figure out, like, as the speakers got farther away, like, delaying when it would play so that it would line up with... I mean, this is probably, like, standard stadium-level audio stuff, but at the time, they were, like, the innovators trying to figure out how to do that stuff. So I think it's, like, kind of the same idea of, like, how to, you know, bring, like, good, good quality stuff. Just, uh... uh just write easy riffs to hear, dude. Just just let chug, rock and roll dude. bands keep playing live music and, <laughs> don't, and don't take and, uh, a cut from the merch. You know, oh, that's the main dude. thing right now and with gas prices. Them, and, you yeah, know, yeah. just like Not cool, dude. Not cool. consider it. Consider what it is that you actually want to see on stage, and stop making it impossible. Yeah, so, totally. I don't know. If I can... For yeah, for a venue to like have an underground death metal show come through and still try and take a percentage of their merch sales you're a fucking snake get the fuck out of here bro i think it's, it's interesting yeah. that it's taken this long for it to become such a thing yeah it's yeah. been 10 15 you know, years since that's when they started doing that so it's dealing with like... it for a long time and yeah. they always send they always send the new kid working with the team to go do that count you know dude comes over with this is Steve. He's gonna do your merch count, and he's like, mm. "Hi, uh, oh fuck, Steve." And you already <laughs> see guy, fuck Steve man. in your mind, yeah. He's been and with the crew for 
he's been with the crew for two weeks now. yeah it's like clean the bathrooms it's like all right clean the bathrooms you just got here kind of thing and go get the merch yeah. cut from these fucking hungover grouches that have slept for three hours you know yeah <laughs> Fuck, totally. dude. there's well, gotta be was... way, some there's gotta be some sort of way around that i don't know like i don't know we gotta figure out something because these these venues we obviously we love our venues and we want them there and we saw during the pandemic they were going away and we were like oh no I mean, the, the the pandemic definitely kind of brought up like the fucking seriousness of like losing them and that's actually like you can't go to the same places anymore but those venues were still taking the merch cut and doing they the also thing. need the artists dude so that's what it is it became yeah. a point where that that industry came should have came to a situation where it's like all right we're gonna continue again um, there's all these Patreon. Here's the things there's that we didn't like about do before. before. There's there's something that you can do. Yeah, here's know. the things that we we you know we're gonna bring up about before that we might want to change now, and it's coming from both sides. You know, the Definitely. venues are like, oh, we want to make up our losses. I'm, so I'm sure, the we're... venue is saying something along the lines of liquor prices are way too high now. We don't get anywhere near the money we used to get from bar mm-hmm. prices, but. Mm-hmm. Right. Definitely. I don't know. So we need your twenty percent on merch or fifteen percent or whatever. Raise gas. Gas prices are super expensive now. So like to travel and all the things like with like. But that's what's insane. up, dude. So like, I forget what band it was, but I loved this. I fucking loved this when I saw this. It, um, it was an advertisement of here we're gonna be. Um, if you want merch, this is where it's sold, and it's a, a picture of their van it's in mayhem. the parking lot. Yep, come to mayhem. us in the parking lot, okay. and and that's where the merch is going to be. Like Ben used to do that with Goat Whore. Yep, and with uh, with Soil and Green, I think it's like yeah. hire a separate and despised like icon. Car car. I bought a despised icon shirt from them out of their van because of that same situation. Mm-hmm. And you actually feel cooler as uh, a supporter because you're like, oh, dude, yeah, right. dude, I'm going straight to the source, dude. Fuck these guys. I'm just going to come to your house and buy a T-shirt. <laughs> it's like, or you could hide buy merch. It from your garage, like, yeah. You can hide merch as a, a band member and put it under your shirt and bring it in and <laughs> cover up the numbers that you sold. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But kind don't do that. Backwards, kind of going in, in a different direction. Did you ever, were, were either of you guys ever guilty of wearing the band merch because you didn't have any shirts on deep? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. of course, dude. Sure. Of course. Sure. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. What? How, how do you not pack enough shirts? What's, what's so hard about that? Oh, when Bill throws all of them out when they're wet. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wet shirts. Man. Good awesome. Damn. Man, one of yeah, the guys getting... in. One of the guys in Monstrosity brought my sweaty socks to me the other night. Nice. I had intended on throwing them away, and he just comes up. He's got my socks in a napkin. Oh, dude, you left these. (laughs) Oh, thanks. I'm like, you're a brave man. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Shit. That's awesome. Somebody was just about to comment on the time. On what time? No, he, he no, he, he didn't oh. get it. I loved it. Dude. It was so funny. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, it's only been two hours. We we no, been on that long. I killed it. That was so funny. Yeah. So, oh, all right. so yeah, so it's been about uh, you know, two hours or so. <laughs> I thought you were about to go into something, Casey. Oh. I have something to say. What do you have to say? Nothing. Um, I, I, I've got something no, to say. Let's get back. I on watched to... your podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> so good. How how was uh, how was the Europe tour that you just completed with Origin? There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. Just, um, I ate dust most of the days. I couldn't get on the schedule. I I couldn't. I insomnia hit. I got sick. I was stressed. I was playing like crap half the damn time. But everything else was really awesome um you know monstrosity it's it's just great to see those guys out there still doing that lee's great lee plays he's such a weird drummer because he's a lefty so he does that weird setup where he's got 10 12 13 you know so because he leads all of his roles with his left hand Mm -hmm. so he's like da 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 it's very bizarre the way he plays um he leads all of his single foots with his left hand, but then he switches over to his right. And it's just really cool. 
He's a left-handed person. He he plays left-handed drums on a right-handed kit, but he plays guitar right-handed. So that's just crisscross all over the place. Um, yeah, they were great. Um, opening band was this band called Intrepid. They're from Estonia. They sound like old grave and old mm. old gore fest. Very cool. Nice. You know, it was it was you know aside from me, you know, and my my personal physical issues is like it was really cool because the the tour we did in the summertime um kind of sucked because management at the time had put us out you know at the back end of this gigantic touring glut so every every show we played we were on the back end of like 10 other metal shows that had happened yeah we talked to paul and he explained this to us too and it just you know, where we should pull 200 people, we might have pulled between 30 and 50. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was actually seven weeks long, and it was two tours broken up. You know, the first tour was Misery Index and Wolf King, and the second tour was Abysmal Dawn and Tombs. And yeah, everybody was great, but like the second tour was a little more successful, I think. Um, you know, we got out towards the West Coast, and I think we started to break away from started to get some distance from all the other tours happening. It got a little bit better, but it really kind of put a hurting on my psyche. I'm like, why am I doing this? This is my first tour back from COVID and it's like this and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But it was nice to be in Europe and get these, you know, full rooms that were into it. Nice. You know, and so that was, mm-hmm. that was really cool. Yeah. I wished a good tour for yeah. you guys. Cause I, I had heard, you know, it wasn't mm-hmm. the most enjoyable tour before that. So, <sighs> I mean, we had some really good times on that tour before that, but it was definitely like, this is what touring post-pandemic is going to be like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is, is like, how long do you sit it out? Because some bands had like, like Cannibal Corpse, they are, they're doing their most successful tours they've ever done. Mm -hmm. You know, other, you know. Cattle decapitation is doing killer out there. Obituary just appeared. Mm. That's you know. So there's a lot of really good shit going. I feel like people really only want the big tours right now. Like they really only want the big fucking rock bands, and they're not really interested yeah. in like the little the little underground underground mm. runs. At least in the states. Yeah. It, it, you know. By people, it, you mean like audiences? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I don't know. I could be wrong. You know, how do I know? I'm not a concert promoter. I mean, that makes sense. You know, Mm -hmm. if if everything stops and then things come back, like people are gonna more want to dip their toes in the more popular, known stuff versus the underground, right? Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like. Maybe I, I don't know what I'm talking about right now. Yeah, it made for me to for a second there. It felt like that would make sense. Like I don't know. It makes me wonder if people don't want to mess around with getting crammed into a tiny club with like potentially unscrupulous like whatever you know. But COVID that, protocol. But. For me, my first show back from all that was a small show like that, and I was super over excited that night to be there you know so i don't know it it, i guess it just varies for everybody you know but i i was eager to get back out there and and be in a hot sweaty place with other humans while we're watching metal my friends (laughs) um totally my first show back was in it was actually it was hipster assassins, which is Kenny Grahowski and Felix Pastorius. Nice. And that went down at this tiny little bar in, in Manhattan called the fifty five bar. And boy, I was nervous. I didn't know how to be in a crowd. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You unfortunately that. that unfortunately that bar closed, which sucks because they've been there forever. Mm. Uh first death metal show was Obscura. Mm. Oh yeah. So. With uh, Beyond Creation and Archspire, or no, no. it was uh, <laughs> Gabe's in here. He can he can lay it out for us. Um, oh oh, that tour. 
Um, yeah, I, I'm having a hard time remembering. But um, I saw it. I know. Um, uh, Veil of Nath. Veil of Nath. There you go. Yep. Nice. <clears throat> Double duty, Gabe. Yep. And interloper. Yep. What's up, Gabe? Yeah. There he is. I would just like to quickly quickly point out Joel's shirt. <laughs> Birds aren't um, real. It's old now, but I I found you know old laundry. Is that the flat earth? Was that is that from the era of the flat earth? No, it's 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 a mockery of all that. It's basically it, like a, it's a, it's a whole it's, movement. It's, satire. Of, yeah. it's a it's a satire kind of thing. But once you're like in, you gotta like pretend birds aren't real all the time. <laughs> and people like will comment going like, "What are you talking about, dude? I fucking shot a bird the other day. I fucking saw its guts." And like it's like, "Oh, yeah. this is another that was a fucking, drone. This is a drone." Like, <laughs> like yeah. and people, it's like a it's like a funny joke. So you just, I don't know. So no, like on the back, it has a big pigeon. It says, "I am a lie." And when I saw that, I was like, I'm That's cool. <laughs> but, and they went and they protested Twitter. They're like, change your icon from a bird because they're not real. And the fucking CEO came That's down and was like, this good. is fucking red. Like, and oh fucking, he's God. all, we're going to change. Crazy. Yeah, That's he was all, crazy. we're changing our icon. We're changing our We're doing it. <laughs> the <bird's laughs> not real. Did yes. they actually do it, though? No, yeah, they said yeah, they would. Of course not. <laughs> yeah. So ridiculous. So that, was, yeah. that was a point in time when people thought the earth was flat. Yeah, yeah. Tool put out a new record. People were rioting over the Popeye's chicken sandwich. And <laughs> oh my yeah. God. got a that's fucking about the time. finger on the and... pulse, dude. Uh, you fucking Tide suck, Pods, dude. Tide Pods, Tide Pods was happening. Oh, yeah, oh, dude, yeah. People were challenging. How, how bad are fucking humans, dude? I mean, really like... social media has brought out kind of the worst of a lot of yeah. humans. You know, I'm just like... saying, like, but the, that list right there just shows me like, wait, I'm I'm part of the same species as the, all those. That was like four like, years ago. He's talking about like that really was talking... four years ago. I don't know, man. It's a it's a weird time. Yes, it is. So <laughs> we got a we got a since I made the flyer and I I believe I put hate eternal and malefic throne flyers on there. We should touch on what's going on with the other projects. Boom. Yeah, man. Um. Well, hate eternal. <clears throat> yeah, we need to go back to MySpace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please yeah please i actually yeah um anyway so uh, hate eternal that one i can get that out of the way quick you know eric is extremely busy with cannibal corpse you know right but i know that he has a handful of the songs written him and jj both so mm-hmm. we're really just waiting for the schedules to line up for that and once that happens there will be a new record have you met jj yeah I love JJ. Love JJ. Have you done two two tours already with Hate oh, Eternal? Okay, well, I'm sorry, that was a dumb question. <laughs> Have I you met your bass player yet? It's an open question. They, 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 okay. JJ. So here's the well, answer. in 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 defense, JJ didn't play bass on the two tours I did. Uh, oh, okay, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. this guy named Art. I was um, gonna say he's a great guitar player too. By the way, and be like, oh, dude, I. This is the thing, dude. John Longstreth has a a long list of things that he's done. So. To get ready for an actual so episode, oh, uh, I'm like, oh shit, it's fucking <laughs> Hate Eternal, dude. Oh man, I okay, all right. Um, but I gotta pay attention to this, this and this and that. So Hate Eternal thing, I didn't. I really feel like Eric Rutan's fucking and John Longstreth is, is like a perfect match in heaven because I know that. Oh yeah, how, how Eric Rutan likes to record drums. He likes to do like one take, motherfuckers. He's not trying to. Oh. And really JJ, I mean that that dude, that dude <laughs> has been a part of that shit for a long time now. He's he, yeah. he gets it too, dude. It's uh it's something that Eric and I have talked about multiple times in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, going all the way back to shit, two thousand four. No, 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 two thousand five, maybe. Right around the time, right when Derek left, he called me. He goes, "Can you do it?" And I'm like, "In three days." Jesus <laughs> no, I can't. Damn. You're crazy. And then we talked about it a couple of times after that, and finally it clicked. You know, yeah. And so it was just something that we've talked about multiple times in the past. And one day he called me up, and he goes, "Hannes can't do the tour. What are you up to?" And I'm like, "I'm going on tour with you, right?" And so that was that. <laughs> nice. Um, Malefic. That, thrown... that must be a, fe- a cool feeling because you're like. I have to say no to Eric Rutan because he's giving me a three day notice, but I know that Eric Rutan had a, a a feeling that I might 
be a possible candidate to get it done in three days. I mean, it was an honor to get the phone call from him. Right. You know, but, you know, you're talking about, like, the third tour for the I Monarch album. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just going to jump in there and try and play that shit on two days, three days notice. Fuck, dude. I mean, hats off to Kevin Talley, who gave it his best. Mm -hmm. I saw that tour. That was with Arch Enemy uh, Mm -hmm. headlining that tour. That was cool. That was the first uh, time I saw, like, a brutal death metal band, like, right in front of me. Talley and the Hate Eternal element actually doesn't seem like you would think that that would be the combination, you know? I don't think it quite worked, but I think... I think Tally got in there and did his best, and you know, got the got the band through the tour. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that's the part. How... That's, that's one of the albums where like he's like uh, Roddy's doing like the polyrhythm shit, right? Well, I think you're talking about like the multiple pedal stuff on the floor. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 yeah, where he's yeah, bouncing yeah. right to yeah. left on on the right yeah. side, kick hat, kick hat, and he's like doing that. kick hat, it's hat, kick hat. Yeah, it turns yeah, into feet. yeah. It yeah, gets yeah. real, real, real polyrhythmic and real crazy. That's a it's really cool. It's a it's not a hard part to play, but it's a hard part to play live. Mm, gotcha. And just because it requires you know, as far for me to play it, it requires some real delicacy just to jump between those pedals like that. So I have to be like you know, and so but yeah. doing that thing live, you know, like halfway into a set and being all pumped up, it's like to pull back and do that my legs just go just lock oh, gotcha. and i just, all yeah. of a sudden i've just got table legs for and they stop it all over <laughs> yeah, the place dude. so that's is that yeah. two on the right and then three on the left like the that's all on the right on the the right foot goes like yeah kick hat kick hat kick hat kick yeah, right on the left is like kick hat hat kick hat hat kick hat three yeah 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 as a as a drummer though i'm actually really like, i can do the feet but i can't do anything else i've always wanted to know though how do you how do you like segment your brain to like pick one thing to kind of be like like automatic and then well, you have well, to the focus right on... would be the automatic the two yeah this is automatic and then right. you have to focus on this one not like focus i don't know what do you think John? well the way that the way that part goes you just you play the double bass from it, and then you just go in steps. You try and get your right foot to jump back and forth, and then, and then you get your left foot to do this, and you do these separately. I don't know how Derek got to it, but the way I got to it was doing each foot separately and kind of create a mode so they're automatic. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of start to see where how they line up, and then after that you got to start putting in the right. The in the you snare know. So the... once you get the feet yeah. working, then you put yeah. a backbeat on it with a snare because you know yeah. your right hand's going to hit the snare. So you hit the snare on the backbeat with the right, and then you start just adding, mm-hmm. building this little house of cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. Was, well, yeah, that's good, really good, what good it is for you like. guys is separation of limbs. So. You just like separated your, your like your lower memory. half. You separated your yeah, lower half to your exactly. upper half. So it's, it, it's segment. It, it's you segment yourself out for a beat to make it understandable and playable. As you practice the part with your feet, and then you start practicing the part with your hands, um, you kind of start seeing how everything lines up. Mm-hmm. And it kind of demystifies as as you and this is the thing is like how do I play the thing? And I'm like, well, you do it little by little by little over the course of three months, and then you'll have it. And you do this slowly, and you know. But that's the problem with every lesson I teach that has to do with blast beats or double bass or double strokes or anything like that. It's it's always these guys that just haven't really. A, they haven't spent the time, time yeah. doing the thing, and B, they mm-hmm. might not have quite the knowledge they need what to spend the time with. Yeah. So then I was teaching, working with this guy about blast beats, and he was just 
running on his pedals, full legged, and just and he wanted to know how to get that up to like 260. And I was like, well, okay. Well, you can't. We're yeah. going to talk about ankle only. We're going to talk about swivel. Yeah. We're going to talk about heel toe. It's, a, it's like, yeah. But well, this the segmenting what, what uh, Anthony brought up is brings up uh, brings up a funny memory of of you when we were playing at House of Blues in Las Vegas. I forget. I think it might have been a summer slaughter or something. But I was standing behind you and just sure. beer, just having a beer, hanging out. And you something fucked up with your hands, and you just grabbed both drumsticks, threw them both down, and yelled "fuck" while your feet were still going. <laughs> And then you grabbed two new drumsticks and just jumped back in. That's so bad. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, don't, like me, don't, don't bring me into this temper tantrum. But, uh, but the <laughs> fact that you could have your feet going, though, and not, and just go like, oh, the arms, whatever. Fuck. Mm -hmm. And to throw both well, drumsticks down. And just you kept, and then you picked up, slowly too. picked up two drumsticks. And we're like, all right, dude. Like back into it. No, it's like, not ass. It's not. It's not dramatic. It's no. That's, I tell my friends like, about that. All the, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a, a story that I tell. It's like a little entertainment, little like, thing I tell people all the time. I've seen that. I've totally. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And then just grabs <laughs> it. Just. It's just yeah, dude, yeah. it's fucking badass. It's actually kind of rad. You should do that like every show. <laughs> <laughs> every show, throw your sticks and puke. Um, well, just, well, my guys have so much kick drums in their monitors. I don't know if they can yeah, hear anything know, else. Too much. I so know. I think they just follow the barrage of kick drums. And every now and then, if a yeah. chime is too loud, that might throw them. But for the most part, it's just brrr, if that's there, they're just <laughs> yeah. You know, I can tell my guitar player can't hear the snare drum when he like backs up. He's got this very specific back up towards me, and kind of goes like that. I'm like, okay, okay you know. Yeah. Um but no, that's, you know. that's that's right, just well, a trip out you can you, know, you can like basically just have the feet you know what they're hearing, so you're like, okay, well I don't give a fuck about my arms right now. Fuck it. Like, god damn it, I messed up a thing. And you grab two yeah. the sticks were fine, but you were like fucking god some, damn it. Yeah. I've done some <laughs> stupid tantrum related shit on stage. I you know <laughs> have, have I we, think we all have, dude. Have I've we definitely talked had a tantrum on stage a couple of times, uh, dude. Mm. Especially Anthony, yeah, for sure. <laughs> have, have we all gone deep into the whole doubles thing and how you pioneered that with the kicks and all that like have mm. you done that yet no because you're the dude dude uh <laughs> like, copper so, crab no. copper crab episode oh copper crab do that okay i just get on I mean, that it's, yeah it's coming out for us all there I, i've been saying that for two years now but i'm just saying dude everyone talks about doubles in the feet i'm like john longstreth like dude like that's the dude like, that's like the back dude. In, the, in the late 2000s you just yeah, we when, were on tour with them and and you Dying just it out. Like, I mean, I the Dying Fetus dude was like in, trying to figure it out too. No like, one else is doing it you. That's you were that, showing Dying Fetus guy how to do doubles because you just you tray <laughs> tray. You were like tray showing him how to do it. Yeah. He was like backstage, like working on it. Now he's got it down. He's I'm a like stick you know. drummer too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I came here. into that around 2006. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's so early, dude. That's insane. Yeah, well, what the fuck? I remember the Joe Stronsick like ballistic double bass thing, and he was just doing you know huh, regular heel sure toe that. on that, and it was a it was a double VHS set, huh? And I never gave it the chance, and then after a while, I kind of by accident just kind of went bump bump and decided to. You know, it's so funny. I, I I hate to interrupt, but like my. Uh back in the day like my drum teacher like in the late he's play, he plays for paul gilbert now he's on that new deal little track oh, cool that paul gilbert, yeah but bill ray shout out he's in seattle but he uh he told me to do doubles like in the late 90s and i was like he was like dude, you gotta do doubles with your feet and i was just like dude like on dw pedals like trying to i was like dude i just not gonna happen <laughs> like you know anyways just want to interject that like 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 you just nailed it figured it out yeah yeah i mean it's i mean it took me a while to, to get it, um, and then I went on tour, and I kind of, I kind of flamed out on it. Didn't go very well, and then I came back and like started approaching it slowly. But um, mm -hmm. hey, can we do an intermission while I go to the bathroom? Oh, go, oh yeah, go piss. piss. Of course, man. Yeah, yeah, I pissed dude. three times already. Dude, pee, <laughs> pee oh, like, I don't want to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I don't want to talk about double. They'll literally do anything. We are a pee friendly. <laughs> you know what? Actually, I got a pee too. <laughs> Right, go P2. for it. Go P2. Yeah, Actually, I got 
What's this dude, are are you, <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, dude, I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. I can tell, like, you can tell when someone's got like something on their mind, they're like, yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, doubles were cool, but yeah, I have to piss so bad <laughs> like, that they're not my, that cool right now. My trademark technique that everyone knows me for. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember go, him. Though. That's the what I remember. It was like we were on tour, it was Origin Dying Fetus, and like the doubles were like the new thing. It was like 2008 or nine. I remember like Trey from uh, Dying Fetus and and John like sitting there like trying to show it to him just going like yeah this is how it works well, and then like, I remember also, him like, he's doing it the longboard uh pedals was what he was into when we were talking about that show that we did in Kansas City or Kansas and um I remember the heel hearing about the heel toe technique yeah and that was the first time I really heard about it was from john yeah while i was fanboying out backstage like that's really all i could figure out what to talk to him about was technique dude oh <laughs> dude, oh, dude. Well, those are really long pedals dude yeah yeah <laughs> let's talk about that i mean that would be dude. such a fucking uh marketing tool like the long boards the long stress i don't know <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah dude hey you're on to something <laughs> but i'm sure he already it was like years ago, like how could yeah, I? Yeah, I'm do sure that? that's that's probably like a 2010 joke. The but... long stretch, long stretches, dude. <laughs> I was uh, I was, I was in my rehearsal room with with uh, BD like today, and yeah. I was like, we got to play some Zenith stuff for fun, you know. Um, so all those songs, it's like dum bum bum ba ba bum ba da da, you know, it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was playing around with like singles versus doubles on those kind of run parts. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm like, I got the doubles, but uh, today singles were feeling better. Sometimes doubles yeah. feel better. It's like kind of a weird, like, what day it is kind of Could thing. it be like a, yeah, like a mood thing? Like you decided to go like, okay, doubles right now for this part and then singles for this part and then doubles. For... Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm not super set on either. Like, like, um, I was actually just feeling stoked that singles were, were solid because we're also in a small room. So it's like, if you play the doubles and you don't actually hear the acoustic second hit it's like kind of lame because you just hear like the double out of the the pa next to you yeah, yeah. And you're looking at your feet you get this weird cognitive dissonance you're like this doesn't that's feel what i'm right. saying with the that's what yeah. i was asking about the the polyrhythms <laughs> like like understanding like what the limb, like once i were to focus on one limb if i had like if i had a robotic thing going where i could just yeah. go like then like no, once i were to like focus yeah. on it i'd be like oh i'm fucked i'm done it is, is it's good. super fun roddy talked about in a comment how he likes doubles at like 150 to 180, like super slow, like do good, do good, do good, do good, do good, like doubles at that speed. He says it's like, it's like uh, being on a boat, like kind of row, like that's how he nice, described nice. it, like a boat on the ocean. It's kind oh, of yeah. this floaty feeling. Yeah, it's fun to yeah. like really slow him down. Oh, yeah. Um, also to Gabe on this comment, uh, no, I don't think <laughs> I'm doing that. I would, <laughs> I would like to, but I'm not. <laughs> But shout out to those guys. Is it hard switching from the single to double technique? I can't. I can't do during it. a song. I'm so bad at it. Yeah, John. Uh, do, you, John do you ever get like when doable. you're playing like you're doing the doubles like and I you're like, ah, I feel singles there. here. Like just in the moment, oh, you change it up. Yeah, just not really in the moment, but First. um, there are certain parts to certain songs that require either. Okay, yeah, sure. and, it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, lately I've just I've been working on a lot more. A lot more of the single the single strokes because it's just something I was never that good at. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so ever is since that, uh, is that what you do if you don't have a girlfriend? Single stroke? Sorry. I'm gonna mute my now. microphone. Here I we go. Almost gave you a smile. <laughs> But ever since Martin Yohanovic started putting up that drum technique <laughs> academy stuff and teaching all that ankle only stuff, I've been you know, looking at Dave Diopold and mm -hmm. um, Kevin Paradis quite a bit. Those guys just have immaculate, like single choke, single single choke, single stroke foot <laughs> techniques that I've been looking at. That I'm like, my God, yeah, you know. And I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be completely locked into the the double stroke thing. I, it's like I've kind of gotten to a point where. I've done so much of that and I kind of want to explore a little more outside of it. So awesome. yeah, I can tell, I can tell that like I've, we've, we've had drummers on here before uh, you've had drummers on the death metal podcast, but um, I've, I can tell that like some people hold it in 
high regard and some people are like oh i don't know you can't hear it it's you know they're doing their whole like oh it's edited kind of thing like the you know like different well, schools of thought come through and then the different elitist kind of um, yeah. opinions come through there you go like, elitist opinions is just you know elitist yeah, opinions fragile yeah. egos there's there is something to be said about guys that are actually trying to hit the notes did it mm-hmm. right right left left right you know and the guys that are just kind of mushing the pedal into the head and you know yeah. just getting this kind of buzz roll thing out of it where you can't really hear anything right. and um that's usually what happens when i get the question how do i set up the pedals or how do i set up the kick drums for double strokes with triggers and mm-hmm. and i'm like it should work you know if you've worked on the technique enough to actually hit these individual notes now when we get up to 270 and 280 yes it's going to become a bit of a buzz roll but then again who's playing 270 and 280 with 90 degree beater angle anyway it's Mm. just it's just not happening nobody yeah so yeah but yeah there's we'd be talking about him right now if it was an actual thing (laughs) um i don't know i've had this conversation about you know what's what's a legitimate technique and what's cheating or what's this and what's that and it, it's just like i don't know i don't, I don't know what to say anymore I, I i had i had all the sharp edged opinions about it you know up and down you know i had all the as you get like, older though you kind of don't care as much about the whole ego thing right you have no nah, you don't yeah eventually yeah it's just an just... older getting older thing well, you have right. to wear whitey tidies and only do one foot blasts. And, else... <laughs> whitey and you have to wear combat boots. Yeah, oh, yeah. which is sick as fuck. I wish I could play double bass in combat boots. But... Oh. But like, My vocalist said it best. He goes, nobody with a job cares about this shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, dude. That's right. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's like, I, yeah, dude. Who's you know anybody who does... Like doubles on double bass rolls and then single kicks all their blast beats that would be a cool combo frank mullen <laughs> wait you mean doing only single blast like it, like single foot is, blast beats and, and double stroke the way i started rolls. laughing yeah, about you said frank that. Mullen and that <laughs> added to it the problem with blast beats <laughs> is that like dude for sure i mean like suffo blasts i mean i don't know about you john but like they gotta be like a suffo blast is just a like two foot right like to, to do the self blast with one foot just i don't know just doesn't feel right to I me don't, i don't know um i always thought the self blast like the thing that made that the most fun for me was playing the self blast and then offsetting the hands and just being in a two foot dock blast mm-hmm. yeah you know, that was always and you can do that seamlessly and that's a lot of fun exactly yeah um i've never seen anybody champion the single footed suffo yeah, i know exactly <laughs> like, that's what i'm talking about fucking go dude my so thing it's like you can champion <laughs> so everyone's championing the single footed split blast or yeah. whatever you know yeah like, i if, i, I, well, like, I, I read the, deal, like i respect the single footed uh, split i do too and i you know yeah. like it sounds it sounds sick like pete <laughs> it, it does sound sound sick. Like, but well, i know what you're saying dude like suffo I, I don't give a pete, shit pete, like, Joel Kerry. Yeah, so about... like caveman style blast. John, but it's like what's your thoughts? Yeah. Single foot blast beats feel better than two foot blast beats. Mm-hmm. I think. The single foot blast works really nicely if if I can make the the ankle only thing go mm-hmm. without it being tense in the top of my leg or the front of my shin. So when that thing starts going, when you start getting that kind of like really rapid basketball bouncing thing, yeah, right. and you sure. play a traditional blast beat like that, that just feels great and it sounds great. Unfortunately, I can't really get much past 240, I think, with that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and indeed. so and the, the two foot thing, it's it it feels kind of weird and, and ploppy and all that stuff, but I mean, um, go, do, 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 I mean, do you get injuries from drumming it's or good. going that fast? Do you get like actual because you're you're exerting your body in such you know ankle blasts? Is, is there actual like injuries that you get through yeah, drumming I mean, through your legs? Dick injury or something like that. I've heard about guys hurting their knees with you know with their their swiveling too hard. Um, 
I've got carpal tunnel in my, actually kind of in both, but I got carpal tunnel in my left um, that I had to go to therapy for, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I know some dude blew his knee up, but mm. I don't quite remember who. Really? Um, Must have been I've hit mistake. myself in the face with a drumstick. Oh yeah, me and oh, I've done that too. I got a black, <laughs> yeah, black guy in the middle of the show yeah. with us. You know, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I don't like. I said I've got the some interesting nerve impingements in both my hands, but it's it's all you can. You know, I, I take care of it, so it's not career ending. Are you doing like uh, exercises before we play? Are you doing like things like that to kind of like make sure your body's ready for? a show like that it's my physical therapist wants me to and yeah, yeah i usually do what i can but um is there anything you do in life that that triggers some other like repetitious moment of your hands or you're just like grabbing something and all of a sudden you're like oh <laughs> shit my hand's doing a gravity blast dude <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? No. So are you talking about? Am I trying to lead the masturbation? Like, 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 no, what, 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 no, I'm saying like you go to grab the mail and all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, dude, I'm doing a gravity bass technique. If I'm well, there's all kinds of things that'll make me not be able to do this. There's all kinds of things that'll make me like do this. Yeah. It's yeah. usually it's usually um diet, dehydration, or lack of yeah. sleep slash stress. Yep. Dude, dehydration That'll... is something so crazy, bro. I've I've been for the last almost two weeks now. I've been back on my water and in eating healthy and all that shit. But man, you were just water. water. Is, oh, no, I wasn't off of water. I'm just saying I'm back on <laughs> drinking like hyperhydration. <laughs> I don't know. Well, just like your mood and stuff, like with water. Like it's if the... I'm at work and I decide to drink like a, two gallons at work. I will drive home from work like, oh, I'm happy. Everything's great. Yeah, you feel so, so like, much better. Like my dude. brain's just, better. If you, you drink know? water all day, you feel yeah, so much better. I don't like water. I'm drinking alcohol. So yeah. Like well, water. no, this is literally like <laughs> after drinking <laughs> over a gallon right. of water today, we're drinking alcohol. So. My girlfriend's an athlete and she hates water and she plays like three soccer games a week at least and she just doesn't drink water the whole time. And I'm like, what did the you fuck? tell her how much she might be like a. a <laughs> Uh, all-star athlete if she just starts drinking a gallon of water well she's already the best one on the field no i'm, I'm saying like what if she fucking murders i know i know harder no i know i'm, I'm pushing oh. her I'm, every day i'm like how much water do you drink and i'm like trying uh, to get her and she's like i feel better one funny story john <laughs> is that uh when oh, i went to, to long island for the first time it, I, and the first tour we did or whatever it was whatever blah blah and like we you know went to the sofa studio and those guys and uh and Doug Bone was there, you know, and he was like randomly just like, Hey man, I want you to show me how to do a gravity blast. And I was just like, Okay, like I don't really <laughs> like do that or like know how to do that. But it was so funny. He was just like, Show me how to do a gravity blast. And I was like, mm -hmm. I kind of can do it, but like I've never done it or on a record or anything like that. It was kind of funny, but if you laugh. He's like, yeah. I've shown you Pierce from Within, dude. Show me a gravity blast. I know. I'm like, <laughs> show me how to play, like, you know, Thrones of Blood or whatever. You know, it's just like so random. It's funny how he plays those um those little groupings of threes in Pierce from Within. He did all that. Those are all single handed drags. Yep. Yeah, they, I know. They weren't exactly they weren't on the snare. I know. It's fives. so weird. This I this know, came up, dude. yeah. So That's Mike Mike crazy. Smith did I it. I love hearing that. I know. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike Smith did it. He did it. Yeah. So, so you're saying like, the, 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 the the is just one hand. One hand. You can see it on YouTube. Yeah, on Doug Bone's videos. Dude, that just made it even. That made that record even better for me now. But I mean, it's. But if you listen closely, you can tell it's not a real. You can, if you listen, you can hear that it's a. It's kind of a drag. It's a it's a smear almost. It's not interesting. really a mm, like interesting. A, so when you hear like, like yeah, when Dave, when it Dave right did it, when Mike, when Mike, when when Dave and Mike both played it, when Tally sure. played it, they were you know you know I think uh, I think fucking the professor um, got it. I think Eric the same. I think they all play that you know the <laughs> usual fun. groupings of threes. So just a smear. I'm I'm on a smear some drums right now, mm -hmm. dude. Um, so Malefic Throne, yeah, is a super group. Uh, it is. 
Oh, yeah. With you. It's, um, it's funny because that happened during co- the beginning of COVID. Remember when when people were talking about murder hornets? Yeah, mm. I do. Yeah, so Steve Tucker puts up on Facebook. He goes, if I had to start all over again, I'd call the yeah. band Murder Hornet. <laughs> and and I was like, cool, can I play drums? And he's like, yeah, you can play drums. And, and then Gene said something, and Tuck is like, you're in. And all of a sudden, like, and then a couple hours later, I get a text from Gene saying, I think we just started a band. Ha ha. Should <laughs> we start a band? I'm like, oh, okay. So we we chatted about that over the next week. And then Gene started sending material. And it was funny because, like, the original Malefic Throne demos were recorded on a little electronic kit that I had set up in my apartment at the time. And um, three originals and a cover. And it's out on Hell's Headbangers, and mm-hmm. uh, is it was funny because that was like I I had acquired enough equipment to do to create a little like recording studio in in my in my rehearsal room. So those actually ended up being the first tracks that I recorded and sent out. But um, signed with Agonia Records recently. And we are, I think, four songs in to what will be, excuse me, what will be a a full-length album. Wow. You know, Mm. I don't know when we'll record it. You know, Morbid Angels getting up and moving again. So, you know, we'll just do what we can. That's awesome. Nice, man. Fuck yeah. It'll be one of those things where we record the drums and the guitars, and then eight months later, we record the vocals or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And that's Malefic cool. Throne. It's Gene Palabiki from Angel Corpse and Steve Tucker from Morbid Angel. Oh, uh, man. So, cool. so, in many cases, it's kind of a spiritual successor to Angel Corpse, you know. Hmm, and, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Dude, having Tucker on vocals, too, that's so rad. I've always yeah. loved his anything he's been on, dude. Tucker's badass. I mean, he's way yeah, badass, dude. Totally badass. So the whole band was there uh, in 1998 in that in Morristown. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Good backtrack. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, uh, there was actually a point in time where they were we were talking to Tucker about doing some guest vocals on Exterminate, but Earache chimed in and said no. We don't want that to happen because the chance opportunity that the Angel Corpse album comes out before the Morbid Angel record and they hear, you know, Tucker on the Angel Corpse record before they hear him on the Morbid Angel record. So, no. Mm. Um, so that's what that was about. But, yeah, you know, and then, to, of course, to kind of put a cap on that, Formulas Fatal ends up being my favorite Morbid Angel record. It's so good, dude. That's Based so mainly good. on Pete. So I was going to say, dude, the speed on that record's so crazy if you really I mean, gate, gateways though get for me gateways i never heard double bass like that when uh opening the gates opening happened. the gates but, yeah no i what, understand what you... but think about formulas being the predecessor to that no i know record, for sure you know no, i know i totally and and pete's already you're either a gateways and a domination guy or you're a covenant and fatal <laughs> It's yeah. getting so specific in what kind of guy you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. I bet you guys also like uh Blessed Are the Sick better than Alters too. No, uh, I no. actually I, I like actually Alters am more. uh ga- Gateways oh, was, yeah, dude. Gateways was so my good. first morbid For me, angel it's, album. It's the odd records. Well, if you start I mean Alters, Gate I mean Alters is insane, but but Blessed is dude. I'm an Alters and a Gateways guy. Or gateways, Jesus. Christ. I'm a domination. Dude, Morbid letters. Angel, just like every album, like just pioneered, like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Every record all. had something. Every, yeah, it's like <laughs> you're just forced to pick ones that you you're like. Looking at better, it in an you like way, all of but, yeah. It's like where were you when you got yeah. into this album? Like, was it? Dude, more it's all about you at a certain time. Uh, Entangled in Chaos. The the, yeah, the, the live one. Shit's yeah, great, dude. That's what I'm saying. You so can that album go wrong with more of an angel, dude. That's yeah. what we're saying right now. I have a D drum four that sounds a lot like those toms, you know, oh, yeah, experiment totally. with that. But, um, <laughs> that's one of the that's funny. It's interesting because, uh, formless fatal. I'm not, I'm sorry, not formless fatal, but um, 
Blessed. Entangled in Chaos. Oh, okay. Like right. A, B, yeah. C, D. <laughs> Entangled yeah. in Chaos versus I love um, that recording. <laughs> gateways to Annihilation. Like the problem with Gateways. Yeah. The trigger, the trigger drums. Oh, right? yeah. I it's know. Like, it's yeah. like I never yeah. heard that. However, however yeah. the trigger drums on, on Entangled in Chaos, I think, sound great. Yeah. Yep. Because you know, it's they're live. A, yeah. They're a little, yeah, yeah. They're a little more in line yeah. with like what was on those those two Duma Borger records that Nick played on. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, exactly. just that, that specific Tom sound if you're going to yeah, trigger dude. the Toms. Um, but what's everybody's okay. opinion what's on that Heretic? One? Heretic, I, I, I actually, I love some of the work on Heretic. I, great, I was yeah. going to say, I very much enjoyed that record. And I think that people didn't have that same opinion when it got like the out. old school fans chiming in about heretic and going like yeah. oh it's not the same yeah yeah no i thought it was great i thought it was uh that one track where it's like give me, let me hear your kick drum pete oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's called drum shake <laughs> no that album is really interesting um i didn't like it when it came out but i loved it after Elude to Venice and Sanum came out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, went back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah I know. But we're going to eventually get to that if we were going to keep hey, talking Kingdom's about Mormon. Kingdom's Disdain right. is, is, is a solid record, though. So, yeah. no, it's, totally. um, there's some really interesting, really like true to form Morbid Angel stuff on that record that just. I guess a lot of people just weren't really into it because of the production. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, that's, I mean, unless we're talking about Elude to Venom, like the only thing that ever really hurt Morbid Angel records for me were the, the production, you know, like a lot of times, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I can even say that about heretic. There was something different with the heretic. The guitar, the guitars sounded kind of like, they were like kind of mid rangey. I remember like, um, they sounded different, but they still had their purpose. You know. Yeah, I mean? but they the guitars did kind of sound mid rangey. Yeah, and the the drums sounded, you know, just like stop doing that to <laughs> stop, stop doing that to that. Pete. He doesn't need that. He <laughs> yeah 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 okay that on gate on, on formulas. It was kind yeah, of like their uh, Saint Anger kind of thing. Like gonna... okay, well, let's go ahead and we'll change the sound of drums now. We'll go ahead and change like the domination. Sound of the what about domination though? Like the drums sound pretty rad on that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. we're going. Oh, yeah. That's going yeah, back yeah. further. Going but I just mean back. like, why does it like progressively <laughs> like, sound like not? You know, because they want to try something different, and they're like, like oh, this, yeah, they have yeah. a producer going like, let's try this sound for these toms, oh. and let's try the sound for this guitar, and sure. like I remember at one fucking, point in time. Bring, bring. Trey said something like acoustic drums do not belong in death metal. What? And I was like, that's a bit of a hard line, but and that was agree. right around the time Gateways came out. Love you, Trey, but I don't agree. Well, I didn't understand what I was hearing when I heard Gateways. I didn't understand that those were fake drums. I was like, I'm not a drummer, so I was like, there's no, a drummer. They're not as fake as they're fake. <laughs> I know, oh but I, I, was, I was hearing those noises and I was like, what, what the fuck is this? This this turned oh. me into like from the cannibal corpse kind of like chunky like playing in a in the pocket to like pushing things faster when i heard that and i was like what is this like is this real i don't understand mm -hmm. i didn't know it, that you could fake anything everything on every i don't think they i don't think that's the thing is i don't think pete faked it uh but everything else opening on that the, record opening the gates opening the gates that that one part that one part yeah, that sounds... he he would have played that back then Damn, I think that's insane. I think the gateways want. isn't people can do, but Joel, you can twitch, you can just you know, have like you can just go crazy. Like, I mean, gateways how long is definitely playable? Well, yeah. think about it how long he keeps that he keeps that run up before he that's breaks it with a drum fill and goes, you know, yeah. I mean, did they fix it to make it absolutely maybe perfect? we need to get Pete Sandoval on the show <laughs> to talk that's, to him about it? I mean, that, that, yeah, we tried. Almost, he almost came on. I already but, talked to him. It was his yeah. wife that answered me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They said no, but it's cool. We tried. He doesn't do these things right now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all okay, good. Okay, though. Yeah. It's all, all right. right. Dude. Yeah. Well, man. Abe, thank you very much, John. I can tell it's fucking. Yeah, I know. We're at like two in the morning. I could, yeah. We got to go it's through like, all of the uh, Cannibal's discography now, and then <laughs> all of really... S discography. <laughs> like each song, we're gonna go through the whole discography and like each song. Tell me what you what yeah. we learned from it. <laughs> so just do, uh, just do deep cut. 
<laughs> dude, John, dude, you're always welcome back on this show, bro. We can, yeah, do man. A, I mean, we'll, have, a, a we'll have to do cut. another one because I feel like we would just sit here and talk until six a.m. I know, no, there's oh, definitely yeah, yeah. so much more about your career that we didn't even discuss. So for sure, I want to back sit on. with you and Paul but and, and like, get Mike that would be even cool to have like a John yeah. Longstreth like deep cut segment Everybody. where we like yeah. cut into something. He just said deep Deeply. cuts. I'm like, oh, dude, the the long nice. we're gonna cut long stress, <laughs> cut long, cut deep. Ah, oh, no, I'm done. All right, <laughs> thanks had, for your time. I'm not too much. Guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, thanks, John. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, you're a legend. All right. Have a I play night. along Thank to you. antithesis a lot of times. It's a lot. I of probably fun. look like a nope. uh, no um, easy beat. I don't do it perfect, but. Yeah. yeah thanks for coming on man i appreciate you coming on and talking with mm-hmm. us and, and farting around with us and it was fucking a lot of cool information that came from it and uh yeah you, we can, you're we, a we legend to us and a friend so oh, thank yeah, you, yeah. yeah it was Most a lot of fun guys. dude we had oh, a great yeah, time dude let's do the plugs one more time battleforgecoffee.com <laughs> all that come on we got to do it at the end real quick too yeah let's just buy your coffee there and Manscaped. uh buy your uh cali death podcast t-shirts at uh Cali Death Podcast. Big and uh, if you enjoyed this debauchery, uh, subscribe at all the areas that we have our shit at. Oh, and um, <laughs> yeah, so bad, dude. <laughs> I missed dinner tonight, guys. I love you, though. So, right. uh, John Longstreth, dude, this was so fucking sick, dude. I really. Yeah. You were on the list in the beginning, and I didn't think that we can get to you, but we got to you, and boom, here we are. I love it. And right. let's do it again soon. Origin, we'll do it again later. All, 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 yeah. uh, <laughs> no, we'll do it earlier, maybe like on a Sunday or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you'll be. We'll wait until yeah. you get back yeah. uh, on this time. No jet lag, all that shit. Not. Two days after a fucking European tour. <laughs> oh man, you know? that's, that's what keeps you alive, though. We'll do it after the we'll do it after the Super Bowl, which we're not going to talk about. <laughs> not yet. What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know. What's <laughs> going on with that? Yeah, Chiefs. Joel's got his back. Had him back. Hey. hey, hey, hey. You mean it's two thousand twenty-three and your team is still called the Chiefs? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it's still going to happen for a little while. But soon why are you keep doing this with your hand, dude? You're chopping, dude. You're Change it That's to just... the chefs. Yeah, yeah. Right, chefs. Let's be really no, quick. Hey, hey. Niners are out of it. I don't really give a shit about that. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to break Chiefs because it's the fucking Joel team, dude. So we're going to do that. And oh, and the John team and the Casey team. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Right. Thank That's you. where we're at, guys. Wait, so, I just thought this shirt had nice my name. Yay, sports. <laughs> yay, know. sports. Listen, go teams. Hey, point ball. Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah, dude. Uh, Joel Horner. <laughs> Score points, guys. Are we rating anybody to be even? Oh, uh, I didn't. I'm just, I don't know. I'm too. You're drunk. laughing at me Jeez. being too drunk. And look at you. All right. Come on. All right. Love you guys. Have a good night. Yes. Rock on. We'll see you next week. Peace. John, rock Bye, guys. on. Dude. Thanks a lot. Have a nice night.